Hi, friends, and welcome to Screen Vomit, the only movie podcast for normal people. I'm, of course, your host, Kayla, and I do have a guest with me today. But before I get to that, if you like the show, you can follow me on Instagram and everywhere else at Screen Vomit. One word on all the things. Leave me a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And if you want to support the show, you can subscribe to my Patreon at patreon.com slash screen vomit. And I do appreciate that. All that being said, let me get to my freaking guest. My guest today is a filmmaker, a comedian, and host of one of my favorite podcasts, Big Grande's Teacher's Lounge. Um, Folks, soaks, and slobs alike will be stoked to hear John Mackey on the episode. All right, here he goes. All right, I'm here with John Mackey. Welcome to the show. Oh, hello. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am here. Everyone, you're hearing my voice, and that's because I'm present. Hell yeah. An experienced yes. podcaster knows oh, to yeah. say when they're here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, and saying, saying, out, saying, and this voice you're hearing right now is what I sound like. <laughs> Often I get um, just plain old filmmakers on the pod, uh, and they nod or smile and... <laughs> You have no, to no, say no. hi out loud. <laughs> yeah, it's I I get it. I understand the medium. Yeah. In mm-hmm. fact, I'm looking at my levels right now also, and I'm seeing I'm a little hot, so I'm going to turn my <laughs> levels down a little bit so that you're not dealing True with the uh, It's distortion. gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, thank you so much for, for inviting me onto the show. I'm yeah, very thanks excited. for doing it. I'm very excited. Okay, first of all, I'm a huge Teacher's Lounge fan, obviously. Thank you. Thank I don't you very I feel much. like that's obvious, but... Um, <laughs> So you know what's wild? I got to tell you this because I think it's funny. Great. Um, so I listened to Teachers Lounge since the beginning, since all the way first episode. Been there. day one. Day one. Mm-hmm. Great. But I never knew through all that time, fave podcast, that you were also filmmaking. <laughs> yeah. And I actually found out in a sideways way that I think is funny. So I had a friend who started posting a bunch of stuff about John Milstein, oh. um, and I said. Who's this John Milstein guy my friend keeps posting about? Google John Milstein. I find all your shorts. <laughs> John Milstein. Folks, if you don't know who John Milstein is, go find him on Twitter. Mm-hmm. He is, and I and I am not, I, I'm a, I am prone to exaggeration and speaking purely in like superlative terms. Uh-huh. But I think he <laughs> is one of the absolute funniest people on the face of the planet and one of the most unique the most unique voice mm-hmm. that I've ever sort of come into contact with. And I have the gotten, most unique number I one, mean, most no one else. No one else makes me laugh in the way that he makes me laugh. Aww. I think that is, that is how I would describe him. He is just the funniest guy. And he is, he and I work together mm-hmm. uh, on stuff at funny or die mm-hmm. back. He used to work at funny or die. And I, I was sort of like a, a, a freelancer who would come in and do stuff there. And, mm-hmm. He and I got to do some of the absolute wildest stuff. Like w- my favorite thing we ever made together was a, a series of shorts called Instagram Island that he wrote, which was about a, a an island that existed inside of cell phones that all like Instagram models lived on. <laughs> okay. And so he and I, a DP, a producer, and like a sound guy flew to Key West, Florida and shot these five short episodes of this series called Instagram Island on a beach in Key West with four like legit Instagram models who were like yeah these people who like you look at and it like hurts your so eyes. So you were on the beach with so some attractive. hot mommies. Yes, uh, <laughs> and poppies. It was mommies <laughs> okay. and poppies. Mommies and poppies. Uh, yeah, uh, and and it was it was just and you're his... saying I'm the one with the cool job. <laughs> <laughs> You're out here well, getting paid to chill on the beach with hot mommies and poppies. But it it was just like the <laughs> just the weirdest experience because like the these models, I mean, they did so great, but they're not mm. actors, so it was like they'd never really done this type of stuff before. So it was like mm-hmm. explain to them they how were like coverage works and mm-hmm. like, oh, we're gonna get it this way, but then we're gonna get a different angle and like Yeah. And it was like such a, a wild ride and it was just just me, Milstein and a couple other friends. We stayed in an Airbnb in the Florida Keys and shot mm-hmm. one day on an open public beach that we had to lock down 
like the sections of it we were using it was like Mm -hmm. such chaos but it was to this day i think one of my favorite jobs i've ever done because i'm never gonna get to do anything like that again you're never gonna see another hot mommy or poppy never never (laughs) never never again uh but through that like sort of funny or die experience he and i just got along really well in like a creative sense and he Mm -hmm hit me up to direct a short that he wrote for a, it was a, it was a one act play that he put up at a UCB show mm. called learning to walk. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, I read it and it's just like the dumbest dialogue. <laughs> like it's like the, the dialogue in it is so stupid. And I, and it just made me laugh so hard just reading it because it sounds like his voice is like, if, if like a robot was trying <laughs> to, was trying to be funny, mm-hmm. but like, missing but because it's so specifically bad yeah like some of the dialogue is so specifically bad good. it's just like perfectly because it's like <laughs> it's like if if you told if you told a robot to be subtle uh-huh. and then and and uh, like be subtle be funny but be subtle and then the robot just like gave you like it just says exactly what it's thinking at all times <laughs> in like the most plain terms and it just is so funny to me Mm-hmm. And so we made that short and then we made another short and we've we've mm-hmm. just been friends for the longest time yeah. now. I mean, Aww. it's got to be probably in the in the like eight to ten year range now. But he's a great, a great, great guy and very funny. And I'm so glad uh, someone has seen the things that we poured our heart <laughs> and soul into because there's still some like learning to walk is one of my favorite things yeah, that I've ever made. I love belly flops, too. Uh, belly flops is great, too. Yeah. Avery Monson. One of the funniest actors. See, I only speak in superlatives. Everything is the best. <laughs> well, it, at Everyone's least they're the positive funniest. superlatives. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't ever. Well, I'll say Everyone things you know are the worst the thing that's person. ever happened. Yeah. Now that you mentioned it, I, I should keep that in my head. Like, yeah. Make sure the superlatives don't come out when I'm talking about bad stuff. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I also just appreciated with, with Milstein. He was like the like a person who had a lot of drive. Mm-hmm. like creative drive to make stuff and that's always been my my biggest like sort of hang up as a creative person is like you're lazy making myself yes very <laughs> lazy and very lazy procrastination comes very uh-huh. easily for me uh-huh. uh and so i've always been the kind of person who needs somebody else to kind of say like hey let's do this mm-hmm. and he was that you need person a boss. yeah basically mm-hmm. i really do even. i need i need a, i need a daddy <laughs> Uh, and Milstein was that daddy. And Mil- Milstein was my daddy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he, he's great. So I'm, I'm so glad that that he is a uh, that he gets any praise because he is just just the best Aww. guy. Yeah, we've we've been kicking around ideas forever of things we want to do together. So now yeah, I saw some article that said you got all this other crap planned with each other too. Yeah, yeah, we 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 like COVID really ruined stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it really made everything hard. Uh-huh. Uh, making stuff is difficult now, but uh, that is true. But hopefully, hopefully now now that COVID's fingers over, fingers crossed. Now that COVID's completely <laughs> over and we're not terrified of this new variant, yeah, <laughs> maybe now we'll make something. But yeah, I, 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 I am I am very positive that he and I will definitely do something else soon. Oh, that's great. Uh, I'm glad you're not enemies. Yeah, it's, it's, no, he's oh, he's just. <laughs> He's also the sweetest guy in the world. I wish Aww. I wish everyone could like talk to him. He's just like <laughs> he's just great. He's great. He's better Aww. than me. He's it's better the than me. Milstein podcast now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. We're not gonna talk mm-hmm. about any movie. We're gonna talk about John Milstein. <laughs> Everybody, let me tell you, this guy. Oh, I, ca- I can't can say said. good things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, that's that's so cool that you saw those things though. Because yeah, that is like the, I truly I made those things. And I was like, oh, they're for me. Yeah. If nobody sees them, it's fine. Well, that's the thing with shorts is they're hard to get out there, yeah. and I respect that. But I also respect shorts a lot. Yeah, I think it's I think a good short film is maybe the hardest thing to make. Mm-hmm. I've seen so many bad shorts. Like, yeah, but they're also so fun. Like it's so fun to like mm-hmm. to focus really hard on something small i think that's why i i gravitate towards like sketch comedy and like sort of mm-hmm. short form stuff too is because again it's uh it's easier uh yeah. <laughs> and you can focus more on like and it costs less like but. like something yeah yeah that's uh, actually now that we're saying it, yeah that's really <laughs> it's all a cost that's, thing i think that's part of also though what's cool about short films is that in that way there's sort of um a more balanced playing field like kind of anybody can get into it you know yeah 
Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 I what I like about it, it is kind of an equalizer where yeah. like like a hundred thousand dollars short isn't gonna can be can be equally as bad yeah, as can be as <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah. can be both equally as bad <laughs> and just as good as mm-hmm. a thing that you spend eight hundred dollars on or or don't spend any money on. Mm-hmm. It's like I've seen so many shorts from people that they spent like nothing on and they're like better than yeah. these like there was that short that I saw that who is it? It's like all these it's like basically like nepotism, the short film. It's mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. Ron Howard it's like somebody related to Ron Howard, <laughs> somebody related to Al Pacino or Robert De Niro. It's like <laughs> oh, Sean Penn no it's Sean Penn's son somebody else's mm. son and then somebody else's daughter is directing it and so it's like this thing and it was like it had a whole deadline article and it was like there was like money behind it and I'm just like a short film <laughs> like, yeah it feels crazy but then there it's gonna get into all the festivals and it's gonna everyone's mm-hmm. gonna love it because of who made it not because it's great and yeah. I think that but I've that also sucks. seen yeah a bunch of shorts that are people who nobody's ever heard of that just like blow me mm-hmm. away and I love that shit I've been yeah. doing a short film challenge for the last year to watch a short film every day. So oh, that's great. I've seen now over 500 shorts just this Whoa. year. <laughs> that's incredible. It's kind of that's fucked actually up. incredible. That's just this year. <laughs> I mean, that's so, kind of fucked up. It's, it's Honestly, kind of fucked up. Fucked up. Honestly, that's kind of fucked up. <laughs> Put me in jail. <laughs> yeah, you should be arrested. That's too many short. I films. should be arrested. It is, I think, over the legal limit. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> your uh, your your blood short film level is over uh, yeah. one point whatever I, mm-hmm. well, I don't know the They're rules about have to alcohol. Carry me away. I don't know either. <laughs> yeah, what is it? I don't 1. drink. 8. I just do short films. <laughs> 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 but I do short films. I do. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. I'm a one substance guy. Um, <laughs> All right. um, So also in your films, not only your shorts, but also your feature. Hello. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. You have really awesome music that you do. Yeah. A lot of it. A lot of it is me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I am. uh, I've always done music like my my since middle school. I was playing. And I think. uh, What were you playing in middle school? I started on the alto saxophone. Okay, Hell yeah. So I was honking (laughs) around on that. (laughs) And then I le- I picked up bass guitar because my brother picked up regular guitar, mm-hmm. and then I learned how to play. The Is your drums brother an well. uh, actual musician, like uh, putting out music musician? Does he he, have a sibling he owns is? a he owns a record label. A record label. Okay, I just thought uh, I saw you post about yeah, having a sibling. He uh, he's he's run a record label for the last like six years. Mm-hmm. That's that is great. Yeah, uh, they're called Grand Jury. Got a lot of great bands. Okay, plug okay. to my brother's. <laughs> record label plug to your brother uh, mm-hmm. yeah plug in my bro here um <laughs> but yeah so I've, I, I played music forever and then like i'm i'm like the kind of person who like i want i'm like co- simultaneously like very collaborative but mm-hmm. also like very much like i want to do it all myself mm-hmm. like i in in certain respects like anything that i can so do you want to get I wanna people do. around tell them to help you and then once they start you tell them to fuck off <laughs> yeah yeah no uh, <laughs> I just mean anything that I'm <laughs> capable of, I want to do myself. Uh-huh. Uh, and a lot of, uh, truly a lot of it was just like money wise mm-hmm. in these short films where I was like, I want good music, but I don't want, I don't have money don't pay to it. pay people. Mm-hmm. So I'll just do it. You That's why I always artists. end up, well, <laughs> I wish I could pay artists. <laughs> I, uh, I don't, I, I actually, my whole thing is like, I don't want to ask somebody to do some do work that I can't pay them fairly for. Mm. So I would rather just do the work myself <laughs> than 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 yeah. ask them to do me a favor. So yeah. I have a couple of friends who I've like worked with on some stuff. My friend Casey Trila, who's mm-hmm. done all the podcast themes for all of Big Granny's podcasts, yeah. which rock he he's crazy. I don't yeah. mean to I don't mean to say it, but he's the best <laughs> musician I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he so he's done a little bit of music here and there but then like for like my feature it was like an hour and 20 minutes of a movie mm-hmm. and i was just like i need so much music yeah so i like used a couple of tracks illegally <laughs> i used a couple of illegal tracks of real bands okay. but then a lot of the score of it uh-huh. is just me <laughs> literally watching the movie mm-hmm with like a synthesizer and, mm-hmm. and just like underscoring moments and like building out little moments within it because it's like 
it's also very fun. Like I, I think yeah. there's something very fun about like being like, well, what is this? What kind of mood does this need? And then trying to like find it with like, it's, it's like, like really fun. Noticeably or, sick. I, I'm, wow. this is a great compliment, but when I watch something that has bad music <laughs> or yeah. bad sound design, Often I'll go watch one of your stuff after to um, palate uh, cleanse. So that's so kind. That's uh, just true. <laughs> I I mean, <laughs> I think what I, is something I, that had good music and good sound? I will watch. Uh, <laughs> well, Mackie I, I am like a firm believer that like I would I would I've never taken a shortcut with sound like mm-hmm. like that. I think in a in a short film or a feature or anything. I think my feature has some problems, but it was because we were trying to shoot it like a documentary, and mm-hmm. so we weren't using like super high quality like audio recording equipment we wanted it to feel like it was made by some idiots <laughs> uh but like with like my shorts with milstein we always like mm-hmm. we have tons of friends from funnier die days who like are awesome sound people yeah. who like came out and like we've we've always like hired pros and then and then i think yeah like pro sound like actual like sound designers and, and like sound editors i think are like a very underrated thing in short films where it's like yeah. Especially in like learning to walk, there was like a lot of like subtle stuff that we wanted to hit that mm-hmm. like like if you go and listen to it, there's like a lot of cool stuff in there. And so I, I had a friend of mine like actually do the sound design and sound mix on that. And then the same thing with belly flops where it was just like, I don't want a shortcut on these things because I think the thing that makes me turn something off the fastest is bad sound bad sound. Yeah. So I'm like sound is crucial. I, yeah. Yeah. I need I need that to be great. Uh, and, 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 and music as well. It's like, if, if I, I think if music is done right, you kind of are like, almost like it, the music in my, in my brain, like the visual to me is like, I'm sitting and I'm watching this thing and then the music just kind of wraps around me so that I can't leave. Mm-hmm. You know? So it's like, you're kind of in this little like pod that is like the sound and the music and the atmosphere of the thing you're watching. Mm-hmm. And you literally just like can't look away or move away because you're kind of like surrounded, hypnotized. So, yeah, so I'm <laughs> kidnapping people with the music <laughs> uh, wow. and sound and all of my my stuff. Big crime doer. Yeah, yeah, I'm a huge crime guy. <laughs> I do tons of crimes, tons of crimes. Oh yeah. Uh, but and I and, support and, that. Uh, mm-hmm. This is a pro crime podcast. Thank you, thank you. It's good uh, to know. It's yeah. really good to know that yeah. I'm in a safe space to say <laughs> that crime. I like yeah. that I love crime. <laughs> But yeah, that truly sometimes the the biggest bummer of of sort of my chosen career path with like making like sketch content and stuff like that, mm-hmm. p- particularly fast turnaround, low budget sketch comedy. Most of my work that I get paid for is that, mm-hmm. whether it's commercial or working on a show with David Spade or uh, old Funny or Die stuff. It was always like we need to do it fast, we need to do it cheap, and so a lot of times I don't get to take the like time and care to like make cool music for a thing that i'm Mm -hmm. i'm doing or like or to really even like make make cool choices in the execution a lot of it is like what's the fastest and the easiest way for us to do this Mm -hmm. let's just get the jokes on camera cut it together it has to be finished tomorrow like yeah so i think that's like the biggest frustration for me in 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 my sort of you don't get to have a lot of creative input yeah Mm -hmm. i'm more so a a cog (laughs) <laughs> in a machine executing mm-hmm. uh and so like having these like short films with milstein and other stuff and big grande stuff as well mm-hmm. there's like opportunities to to make things a little more interesting and i i like that and i want to do more of that but Hell yeah. sometimes that don't pay the bills yeah <laughs> sometimes the big or ever the big guys <laughs> with the big money uh-huh. those guys pay the bills yeah that is true I, cool music doesn't pay the bills in my sketches. No, but it does rock. <laughs> it does rock. Thank you so much for saying that. Yeah. That I I, I love I, I love the music in in Learning to Walk and Belly Flops and in my feature. Mm-hmm. I think it's all really good. And you I have music really for like couch making, too, right? Uh, I did, did some of that. Some of that's me. Some of it is Casey, and mm-hmm. then some of it, it, I believe, yes, yeah, some of that is my friend Daniel Hart, mm. who since then is now a like very high profile composer who Whoa. most recently did the score for the Green Knight, David Lowry's Green Knight. Okay. He did the score for, all, basically he's done the score for all of David Lowry's movies. So Couch launched so, him into being a full celeb. Yes, mm-hmm. I did a short film <laughs> and then he did all of your favorite movies uh-huh. and TV shows. You gave him a boost. 
I gave him a little baby boost. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that that yeah. I think he'd that I think most of the music in in Couch was Casey and Daniel, and then I did some like little incidentals. Mm-hmm. But then everything since then, Casey did a couple songs for Belly Flops or a couple little bits for Belly Flops. But then all of Learning to Walk is me, and all of uh Lane Woods Finds Love, which is my feature film. That is me as well. Plus a couple of songs that I stole. <laughs> They're stolen. Yeah. And if if the major record labels are listening to this, I'm sorry. <laughs> I haven't made a dime. I haven't made a dime and I won't ever make a dime. From and it. you're not connected with uh your brother's label in any way. Exactly. So not no, even a little bit. no clap back on him or no, anyone else. No, he had no part in this. <laughs> It's all me. If any, if the hammer's coming down on anybody, <laughs> bring it down on me. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that all that rocks. Um, should we Thank get you. into our movie for today? I think we got to. We simply have to. So I the think movie we've gotta. that was picked for today is the 2021 film. Come on, come on. Mm. 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 <laughs> mm, Films that folks. make you say. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Made me say, mm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so you picked this film. So what made you pick this film in particular? Without spilling too many beans, because we will get into it. Okay, so for me, I am the kind of person who I like to go to the movies alone. Mm -hmm. Same. Because I see everything, and a lot of times, like, there's stuff. Like, just for, for example, I saw Come On, Come On the same day that I saw the new Ghostbusters movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very strange pairing. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But like, I've always like- Wait, which one did you see first? I saw Come On, Come On and then Ghostbusters because I thought thought seeing, I thought seeing like a big, stupid, like Hollywood movie first and then going to see Come On, I didn't feel like it would, it would make- sense but you thought being emotionally devastated and then trying to do something goofy would be better it would yes it would make me feel i would leave and feel good in case come on come on made me depressed i would leave and see ghostbusters and i'd feel good okay little did i know that Mm -hmm. ghostbusters was gonna bum me out uh more than come on come on no um but no the 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 point is I think pre-COVID, I would go to a lot of movies by myself, and like I, I just like the experience of like being alone and like be letting a movie hit you however it's going to hit you, and not like not like the process of like reacting with somebody. Like mm-hmm. I don't like that. I mean, I like that for like a Fast and Furious movie, but like for a movie like Come On, Come On, I want to see something. I want to see it. It's by a myself. personal experience. Yeah, yeah. And so this was the first. This was the first movie I saw by myself post COVID. Oh, okay. uh, post quote unquote COVID. Yeah, because COVID's over, famously. COVID's over. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but this is the first the first movie I saw by myself, and it was but you like you saw several during COVID. In the middle of COVID, I went to the theaters. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the first one post. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but no, I this was like my first sort of solo movie experience in mm-hmm. two years. Okay, and and it was just like it hit me. Ex- it just hit exactly the notes that I love in movies where I like, I like, I love it when like, it's clear what's going on, Mm -hmm. but nobody is like staring you in the face and saying, do you understand this? Mm -hmm. Do you see what's happening here? Yeah. Uh, And I just really, I like, A, very much the the, like sort of family relationship and the sort of art, the, the like dynamic of brother and sister here resonated with me in like a very real way. Do you have a sister too? I have, well, I, I have step siblings and then I have a, uh, my brother who's a mm. biological brother, but we have- You imagine having a sister? Yeah. I, well, I think, I think, I, I just, I think the thing that really hit me was the like, they just like pick at each other mm-hmm. in a way where they are, they are frustrated by each other, but you can tell that they like really deeply love each other, even if they don't say it or, or spend time with each other. Like you can tell that they really care about each other, even if they're like, there's tension. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is something that like really resonated with me, not specifically for my, literally my sibling relationships, mm-hmm. but there are family dynamics within my family that the, that, really resonated with okay and then i also just like i think i as a 35 year old dude who is like single and live in a weird life that's hard to explain to people 
I think I like <laughs> identified with Joaquin's character in a lot of ways because he is this kind of like man, guy who's single who is just like, yeah, I guess that's fine. Yeah. And like, or is that telling himself that he is happy with his life? Mm-hmm. And is probably, and it, I just really identify with that, and also just the the relationship between him and his nephew. Mm-hmm. Like I have that relationship with certain uncles of mine that I just really saw myself and and in that relationship. You identified with both the man and the boy. Yeah, in a certain mm-hmm. sense, because I I think I am on both sides of that equation with different relationships in my life, where I have okay. nephews who like are weird and and, but also awesome and like so fun to be around but also so annoying (laughs) and like and like tough to handle so it was just like kind of I think emotionally an experience that just kind of throughout really kept ringing very true to me and like I felt I felt very connected to the whole story as it was going on which sometimes in these kind of movies that are a little bit more like slice of life like not a, not making a big obvious point mm. i sometimes can't connect but this one just like kind of from the moment it started i was like oh i'm just like so on board mm-hmm. uh with this and i think just like this the style of it and and the, i thought the black and white was beautiful and it's just it was just like one of those perfect storms of like i really wanted a solo movie experience mm-hmm. I went and saw a movie by myself and it was a movie that like just totally landed Mm -hmm. for me. And I cried in the movies for the first time in two years. You know, it's like, that's a great experience. Yeah. Like, like feeling things is cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it was, it was just like, uh, all the good stuff happened while I was seeing this movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I went to Ghostbusters and ruined it. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Ghostbusters was fine. Uh, <laughs> no superlatives for Ghostbusters. Uh, no, no, no. We're going to avoid superlatives. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Because of what we said earlier. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I just really love this movie. I like mm-hmm. I, and it was kind of, yeah, I don't even know really how to say it any more than just like, I think it was exactly the right movie that I needed to see when I saw it Hell and yeah. it, it made me feel great. And I kind of feel like that about all of Mike Mills' movies. So like what was beginners. your, yeah, so this was, was directed by Mike Mills, uh, written and directed by. So what was your relationship with Mike Mills films before this? You'd seen it, all of uh, them? I'd seen, I've seen them all, yeah. And and I think they all, they all do the same thing, which is I think they make you identify, like you can just, f- you feel like all these people are real people and you feel for them in so many ways. Mm-hmm. And none of them are like, I think the thing that I hate with like, quote unquote artistic movies or like art movies which I think come on come on is like a little bit more like stylized than a lot of people are used to in a movie Mm -hmm. but what I hate is when they're like intentionally not making the movie have a plot Mm -hmm. you know I feel like there's a lot of movies that are just like yeah this movie doesn't have a plot it's just just watch these characters Mm -hmm. but I think what Mike Mills does a great job of is like just showing you the like subtlety of like human like human behavior and like that an emotional arc doesn't have to be this like huge change in a person. It's just like almost like these like very small moments that are born out of bigger like things. You know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. what's the su- the subtle changes in characters that are born out of like a crazy sort of change in their life or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's like it, it doesn't he doesn't like beat you over the head with what his movies are about. He's mm-hmm. like, isn't this just nice? Like yeah. to see people being people. I also was like very late to the party with him. Like mm-hmm. I had a bunch of people who were just like, I think oh, I'm you guys beginners. Yeah. <laughs> so before seeing Come On, Come On, I had only seen 20th Century Women. And, really? And I only watched that because my friend was supposed to be in it who unfortunately got cut out of the movie. Oh, but, no. Um, so I didn't even know of Mike Mills as like, a name at that point really but when so I post everything that I watch on our Instagram and when I posted that I was seeing this film which I I saw this film a few months ago the first time um, at a film fest and when I posted that I was seeing this so many people were like I love Mike Mills like this is the best movie how are you watching this I've been dying to see this and I just (laughs) kind of like 
picked this to see at random. Like, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I saw Joaquin on the poster and I was like, that looks cool. I don't know. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> he generally does all right. Yeah. And I mean, you know, when you go into a film fest, you pick some stuff you never heard of that might be new, weird, indie, and then some stuff that you can have some familiarity with. At least that's yeah. what I go in doing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I was. this was one that I was like, some familiarity <laughs> with this. I know an actor in this. That's, yeah. you know, could be interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so that's why I saw it. But since then, I have seen everything, almost everything that Mike Mills has done. And now I am also a huge fan. Yeah. Yeah. He's just, he just, uh, his approach in general, I mm-hmm. think is just, he also, his casts are always so like incredible. Yeah. I think that that's like part of it too. It's just like, I think it helps that like at least his last three films are also very autobiographical so that mm-hmm. he can impose so much so much onto them. I don't know. So much history yeah. and and emotion into them. Yeah. Yeah. And it ma- it makes it they all feel like re- they feel so real. Mm-hmm. And which which is something that I, I, I love when it's just like a real story, you know, mm-hmm. like I love a crazy big Marvel movie, but it's like these it are seems so nice. in many ways. Yeah, more complicated to write something that is real and natural and... And and to feel like it's interesting. I think that to me is like, is the thing that is so like perplexing for me because it's like on paper, Mm -hmm. this movie should be boring. (laughs) You know, like this movie should be super boring. Mm -hmm. Guy who does podcasts or like like audio stories for (laughs) newspaper... We're starting off with a podcaster, all right? It's already cringe. Yeah. <laughs> it's truly. It's like it's like how is this good? Uh but then you watch it and it's just like so funny and mm-hmm. so like so warm. Yeah. And also like the the like conflict and like the sort of more like difficult parts of it mm-hmm. are presented in a way that feels like very natural and real to me. Yeah. And they're not like like the conflict of it isn't isn't the point i guess maybe like it's like it's like the conflict is just like it's there but it, in the way that it is with regular human beings like so yeah. f- infrequently do we have these like huge catastrophic like conflicts with with especially with like family it's just so much more complicated than just like oh i hate my sister yeah you know what i mean it's there's like there's a lot more nuance that's often yeah yeah, yeah. and it and it's like the, with like beginners too, where it's mm-hmm. like like if people haven't seen that movie, it's incredible. But it's basically about like a guy whose dad, very late in life, comes out, and sort of they are both sort of navigating this like new life, mm-hmm. and that's like a huge thing. But it's done in such a way that it's like there's just so many bad ways to do like like these kinds of ideas, and mm-hmm. I think he always just does them in like the most like subtle yeah gorgeous nice. way yeah 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 and they oh, they look like his movies look so good too. Mm-hmm. this Truly. movie come on come on had some of the most beautiful shots yeah like uh the black and white did a lot but it was just like even just like the shot of like them not to talk specifics too early i don't know if we get it but <laughs> there's a shot of like them by the santa monica pier mm-hmm. that's just this big beautiful wide shot and i'm just like i could sit and just stare at this for mm-hmm. two hours Hell like yeah. that's kind of how I felt the whole time in this movie. I was just like, I could just stare at these pictures for, for hour about and two hours and some. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Truly, that's all you got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, so yeah, let me run through the little bit of cast here. So we have Scoot McNary, who plays the boy's dad in this movie. It was in two movies we've done on the podcast: Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Gone Girl. Uh-huh. Um, Gabby Hoffman's in this, who most people know from Transparent and Girls, I think. Joaquin Phoenix, obviously already mentioned. Woody Norman, new on the scene. I Woody. Think, I think his this name's is, Woody. His name's Woody. He's also British as damn hell. Mm-hmm. And I told you this, but when I saw this at the film fest that I saw it at, he did a and a afterwards. And oh. when his little baby boy British voice came <laughs> yeah. out... The, the whole theater. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> what? Everybody wants their money back? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know I was watching a British boy. Yeah, we've been played. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, where's Ashton? Um, <laughs> so, 
But yeah, he rocks. Uh, I think this so movie is absolutely going to kickstart his little career. Absolutely. Molly Webster, who plays Joaquin Phoenix's kind of podcaster co-worker, also is a actual Radiolab uh, worker, podcaster. Um, and then I have some... Uh, crew credits too on this that are Mm. cool so you mentioned the cinematography um cinematographer for this was robbie ryan who also did marriage story and the favorite which are like Mm. award-winning films Uh, the favorite one one of the coolest looking movies i've seen in a while yeah so he did both of those among other things but um and then the soundtrack on this movie was done by the desner brothers from the national Mm. And it's perfect, I think. Yeah. Are you a national head? I'm not a huge fan. I got into, mm-hmm. I really got into one of their albums. Which yeah. one was it? Not the most recent one, maybe the one before that. What was it called? I'm going to look it up because it's going to, I have to. <laughs> the Trouble Will Find Me. Which mm. one's it? Yeah. Trouble Will Find Me. 2013. So it's been a few ago. Been a, a little uh, bit ago, yeah. Yeah. But that one really, that one really got me. But I think they are very, uh, very, very, very good uh, musicians. Yeah. They do good jobs. They do, they good, do job. good jobs. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> they do and good. They do good job. <laughs> and they had also obviously previously worked with Mike Mills as well um, on a short film that he did to go with one of their albums, I Am Easy to Find, which I haven't mm. watched that one. Uh, but yeah. It's basically I mean, like a 23 yeah. minute long yeah. music video. <laughs> hey, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> All the way. If there's anything I want music videos to be, it's longer. <laughs> Honestly, make them into something. Yeah. We got to go back to the days of the event music video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah beyonce did it gaga's yeah, done it a couple it. times taylor did it yeah uh i'm a big fan of, a, of an event music video yeah and also we got to bring back mtv's making the video oh yeah yeah that was, that was i was addicted to that show. and if but we can get pop-up video back decided. too that'd be pretty sick mm. but that was mm, vh1 yes. of course <laughs> yeah but we love we love we, we love them all we love, we love vh1 TV we love mtv shout hell? out <laughs> yeah <laughs> Back when TV yeah. was good in our day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> it is what it is. And you know what? The shit was good. So yeah. what are you going to do? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. All right. <laughs> and then critic scores on this movie, very good. 96% on Rotten Tomatoes, 91% from Google users. So you know the shit's actually good. I want to go and and I want to read the bad the bad reviews yeah. for this because if you reviewed this movie and you think it's bad, you're just you're wrong. I had one person who messaged me saying that it was pretty good but also a bunch of Z's as in mm-hmm. snores like they were sleeping, but I I just can't see that. I can't see yeah. uh, being bored by I this did, film. I cannot abide. No. <laughs> It was not <laughs> snoozy. No, I, yeah, I disagree. If you thought this movie was snoozy, you're not a human being. <laughs> I think uh-huh. it, it's uh, that, that person was upset. also a man, so I was like, maybe they just don't have like the access to their emotions, or you know, I truly, yeah. I think that that is probably a lot of people's mm-hmm. experience. Is they're just like, oh, this is this this makes me feel weird. Also, sorry, listener, if you're listening. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sorry. <laughs> You're wrong. Sorry for you are me. wrong. <laughs> DM me. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you you're wrong because you are wrong. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> so we should watch the trailer and then we can oh, get great. really into it. To visit planet Earth, you'll have to be born as a human child. At first, you'll have to learn to use your new body to move your arms and legs. You will learn to walk and run, to use your hands to make sounds and form words. There will be so much for you to learn and so much for you to feel. Sadness, joy, disappointment, and wonder. You will grow up, travel, and work. Over the years, you will try to make sense of that happy, sad, full, always shifting life you are in. And when the time comes to return to your star, it may be hard to say goodbye to that strangely beautiful world. Damn this book. 
You're crying. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. You're definitely crying. See, you're crying. <laughs> Gorgeous. It's so good. It's so oh, good. What a great trailer. It made me feel the way, yeah. I know. It perfectly encapsulates the feeling of the Are movie. Are you crying? <laughs> Honestly, a, a, not tears, but it definitely is just... Mm. But like kind of. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm close. <laughs> the, I could get pushed over the edge yeah. pretty, pretty easily right now. Aw. <laughs> it's so good. God, it's good. Okay, yeah. This movie... Uh, Woo. It a uh, spoiler alert fucking rocks. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry for the spoiler. <laughs> yeah. Big spoilers ahead. It's good. <laughs> All right. So setting this up, um, this film takes place over four cities, Detroit, LA, New York City, and New Orleans. So not only does it take place in these locations, but I feel like they really took care to show the hearts of these locations, which was really mm -hmm. cool. So like we start in Detroit and um, they show the Heidelberg project in Detroit. I don't know if you've ever been there or heard of that. No, I've never been to Detroit. Oh, really? So. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm in the Midwest, I guess. Spo <laughs> Second spoiler. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I... So I used to be a touring musician, so I've toured oh, wow. all over the Midwest and the East Coast a whole bunch. I've been everywhere. But the Heidelberg Project in Detroit is one of the coolest like hidden gems in the Midwest, I think, or at least it used to be. So it's like a, a couple blocks of Detroit that were reclaimed by an artist. I don't remember when, maybe the 80s or early 90s, but it's still there that are just all the houses are painted with arts, the whole neighborhood, like there's art in the yards you can just walk around and like oh, interact with it yeah, yeah 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 there used to be like a house made of records that was a full building just all made of records that you could Whoa. walk inside of um but last time i went there so i went back there in peak covid um, <laughs> <laughs> peak. <laughs> peak covid i was traveling to another state um oh my gosh. <laughs> by car to go outside <laughs> um okay but a lot of it's been taken down. And I think there were like plans put in place by like their mayor or something to completely demolish it over like some period of time, which really sucks. Because the first time yeah. I went was maybe in like 2013 or so. And uh, it was just the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Yeah, I think to, to your point about them sort of like how they treat each of these different cities. I mm -hmm. think the cool the coolest thing to me about this movie is like the... Not the coolest thing. Again, stop saying coolest. <laughs> stop saying EST. There's no ESTs. What I really liked uh -huh. was the sort of device that they use in the film. He's doing this like sort of radio project where he's interviewing yes. these kids. And he, we're hearing kids in each of these cities basically talk about the future, mm -hmm. what they think the future will be. And it's such an interesting, an interesting like sort of peek into the like sort of like anthropologically into like these cities yeah like how kids are approaching their futures yeah and i can't specifically remember if there are there are any like big resonant moments but it was just like very cool to me because it was very obvious that these kids were real people who lived in these cities that they, they are, were just yeah. interviewing yeah like they're interviewing kids about their future mm -hmm. and it's just very a very cool little window into that place mm -hmm. when you hear kids talking like what do kids value in those places how are kids thinking about themselves and the world mm -hmm. in each of those places and how are their sort of priorities different and everything based on just where they live and i thought that was like so fascinating to like the some of the most fascinating stuff was like hearing these kids talk about their future and how like optimistic a lot of them were made me feel the so optimism good optimism was really yeah that was so oh. sick because when i think about like I have more of like a, a first reformed. Have you seen that movie? <laughs> no, <laughs> more no, of no, a first no. reformed no, um, uh. <laughs> view of the world, which is so basically when I think about having a child in this day and age, I mean, all I want to think about is like the doom that's coming to them. Like I would feel yeah. so guilty bringing a child into a world like this. No yeah. offense to the parents who listen, no, but I think I think it's a very common sentiment. That's what yeah. First Reformed is about, and also you should watch it. By the way, uh, I, I've, <laughs> it's it's been on the list. I know. Yeah, <laughs> but I think I think that that is like a very common sentiment in the generation surrounding myself. Yeah, in like like the sort of maybe like one or two generations before me, 
and the two two ish generations after me. I don't know when we separate generations, but like mm -hmm. I think I think that like weirdly seeing the way that these kids talk about the future gave me hope because yeah. I think that like something that is happening right now is kids today I think are going to save the world. Like mm -hmm. I truly think that like the generation of kids that that are like teenagers right now are going to be the generation of of human beings that like literally save the world. Mm -hmm. Like because I think that like what we all see as like all of the chaos and everything like that, I think kids today are like aware of that, but also like have kind of existed in a time where people are being like, we have to fix this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think all of these kids are kind of coming up with being surrounded by the idea that like, oh, the world's actually kind of broken and we have to fix it. Mm -hmm. Whereas like our generations sort of saw the world breaking and we're just like, fuck, fuck. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, 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 so now it's like these kids are just like, no, 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 we're going to make it better. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was something that I found very hopeful in this was like seeing kids who were like, ex weirdly like excited for the future yeah. and being like, like w one little girl in the, in it says something to the effect of like, I know it's bad, but like, I hope it starts, it starts being like less bad for people or something. Mm -hmm. Like I can't remember the exact phrasing, but like. There was a couple of lines that these kids said that I was just like, man, there's just like so much like empathy in these kids' hearts that I think is like missing from a lot of people these days. And it just made me feel very hopeful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and like the world isn't falling apart and that maybe it's going to be all right. <laughs> and that my brother, my brother who just had a kid, mm -hmm. maybe that kid's going to grow up in a world that isn't in literal flames. Yeah. I mean, we, hopefully. Yeah, and hopefully. at least, you know, if they do grow up in a world that is in literal flames, at least like they feel good getting up to the flames. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I can't well, imagine trying to be a young person coming up and that's like you know what your future is. I would be so fucking yeah. hopeless and bleak. But it's also like like I not to have an even deeper existential conversation than we can we're go having, deep as hell. Like, I don't care. But like I think that like <laughs> something that like kind of the main like Woody. Uh, mm -hmm. the kid play, who play, plays the, the kid in this, mm -hmm. his sort of attitude and everything like really did like make me realize that like kids are like smarter than anyone ever gives them credit for. Mm -hmm. Like they know what's going on. Uh, I think like that's like part of this movie is like, yeah, you sort of realize like, oh, this kid understands a lot more than mm -hmm. adults would give him credit for. Yeah. And I think that like human beings are very adaptable and and especially kids who are coming up in this rapidly changing time where like it seems like there's always something new for these kids to learn about the world that that we never had to be exposed to when we were younger mm -hmm. like i think that like because human beings are so adaptable and these kids are are dealing with all of that they will adapt to this new flaming world in in a way to make it okay mm -hmm. you know it's like i think that's like weirdly to me Every gen like every generation is chaos, but like ultimately, like we make it work. Yeah, and true. and I think that that's like kind of something that I'm sort of seeing in these conversations with these kids is like, yeah, the world's gonna be crazy, and it's gonna be bad, and it's gonna be on fire, but ultimately, generally, people are good, mm -hmm. and people have hope, and they and and we do human beings want things to be good. Yeah. So they will at least grow up in a world that they are comfortable in and 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 find happiness, I guess, mm -hmm. is what I think and I hope. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, it, I may be speaking to, in too broad of uh, generalizations about people because there's definitely some horrible people in the world. Yeah. But it just it just was very nice to see these kids be like, we're, we're going to be okay. We're going to be and, okay. And We're like, going to take care of yeah. each other. Things are going to be yeah. good. I'm going to be happy when I grow up. Like that was all, yeah, yeah really nice to hear. And yeah. um, so Mike Mills actually did a project where he interviewed children in 2013, specifically children of like Silicon Valley tech people uh, who all oh, had weird. like tech parents about their concepts of the future, which specifically because they have parents in tech you know, tech and the future, there's always kind of different ideas going on. You can find that on his Vimeo, actually. Uh, I'm going to go watch it. Yeah. I think that that was sort of where that came from for him to this movie. Yeah. Um, so that's just kind of cool. It's great. Kinda Such cool. a great yeah. device. It is. Yeah. Some of my really favorite cool. 
moments in the movie or yeah just those montages of kids talking and it's really grounding too yeah just to come snap back to a little bit of reality uh every so often because yeah they do peep back in throughout the movie yeah mm-hmm. oh, it's beautiful <laughs> mm-hmm. these kids 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 brains are just so good i just like love hearing kids talk like because yeah. it it is like it makes you feel good yeah. when you realize like oh there's good kids out there who are like gonna grow up and be good people mm-hmm uh, Mike's child's preschool teacher was the one who sort of instilled in him this way of talking to children as if they are your equal too. And mm-hmm. the preschool teacher is in the film. Oh, really? Yeah, that's cool. just for a moment, sitting at a table with Gabby Hoffman. But um, that's great. Just that that kids should be approached as if they're on a level playing field, and their feelings should be respected as much as anyone else's, and they often aren't. Yeah. 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 Oh no. I mean, how many kids get told like? Oh, don't you, that doesn't matter. Like, oh, stop. Yeah. Like you're, like you're upset about nothing. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like that I think is, is the reason so many people around uh, my age Mm -hmm. are afraid (laughs) to be, yeah, truly like (laughs) being told like, oh, you're not upset that you like spilled your cereal. Mm -hmm. Like, no, I am. I wanted to eat this and it's now a thing I can't eat. Mm -hmm. I no longer have the thing that I want. Yeah. Like, or that I need in this moment. Like, it is a real feeling. And so often kids are told, like, you can only really react to, like, certain things. Yeah. But, like, no. Like, every feeling that a kid has is valid. I think my brother has has talked to, to me about that, too, about, like, validating kids' feelings instead of, like, telling them they're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> like, you had yeah, to have a talking to. Idea. <laughs> sounds like a good idea. Maybe I'll stop telling these kids that, that they're stupid. Idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Mike uh, has also been quoted as saying like that he grew up in a culture where he felt he was unallowed to be sad and mm. that that's why now a lot of his films are kind of sad because he thinks art is exercising things you didn't get to say before um, mm. and expressing things you haven't previously been able to express in another way. And mm. uh, it's what you're not allowed to do is what yeah. art is. So, yeah. so that also kind of relates to him as well. I guess yeah. I just have like five quotes from my little yeah. right up top. It's just random. I mean, that's great. <laughs> but they it's, all fit together. <laughs> yeah, and it, it definitely is relevant to like this in turn. Like this movie is mm-hmm. is feels exactly like that. Mm-hmm. It's like all about kids' emotions yeah. and like ex- expression and like uh, the way that adults react to mm-hmm. these kids' emotions. Like it's that's the whole thing. Yeah. All right, so in the film, back oh, yeah, we to talk about the bringing movie. it back. We're talk about the movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Joaquin's sister, played by Gabby Hoffman, lives in Los Angeles. You mentioned their sibling chemistry, but it's got to be noted it's off the damn charts. They have great sibling mm-hmm. chemistry. It's the realest relationship that I've seen, like brother sister relationship. Yeah, that I've seen in a movie. Also, like physically, just being like two depressed siblings with really strong eyebrows, like they just really go together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They do have eyebrows, folks. <laughs> Woo. Wait till you get a load of those brows. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're, oh, I just it, immediately, they're, the way they interacted with each other, I was just like, yep, mm-hmm. this is, even positive interactions are sort of tinted with, ne- with previous negative ones and mm-hmm. negative interactions are tinted with, yeah. with, with love. It's mm-hmm. like, that is exactly what a, like a brother and sister who have been through the shit. They're that both is what very it is. good at like this naturalistic acting. Where like mm-hmm. they're not really playing any character; they're just them, and they are the character, and they're mm-hmm. both very good at that. Especially Gabby mm-hmm. Hoffman; I think that's kind of what she's known for, even. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but Joaquin's really good in this too. Yeah, no Joker stuff here, folks. This is him <laughs> being <laughs> him, just being him. Yeah, no Joker stuff here. They did say that in some of those interviews that he was doing with the kids, every now and again, one of the kids would be like, "Oh, I know you. You're the Joker," <laughs> and he'd have to be like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, tell me about this room. Like, tell me about your house or like whatever. <laughs> shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, kid. Shut up, shut up. No, I'm not. Yeah. So kind of the storyline going on with the mom is that the kids, her kid, his dad moved to Oakland and she has to go help him move in is kind of what's going on at first. Although later we get some more colors to what's going on there. But um, she needs someone to watch the boy. So... Joaquin goes to L.A., and that's where we move to L.A. here. And that's when we meet the kid, the infamous kid. I mean, this kid's incredible. It's like precocious isn't even like the right word. Mm -hmm. Like this kid feels like an adult. 
Like, yeah. And, but he feels like that kind of kid that we've all met. Yeah. Where you're just like, you almost want to just be like, you're joking. This isn't. <laughs> You're not really like this adult mm-hmm. already. Like you don't you don't already have this way of interacting with people. But you, it, it was so like like I have cousins and 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 stuff who were this kind of kid. Yeah. Where like you talk to them and you're just like, I feel like you could be my therapist. Yeah. <laughs> like that's what I felt like to with him. I was just like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would talk to you about real stuff. Yeah, and they've all the cast have all sort of said similar things or like that they were just sort of looking to him even for guidance like <laughs> yeah. through a lot of their scene work together or yeah. just saying like Joaquin said in an interview like I would just watch whatever Woody was doing I'm just following Woody and as long as yeah. I follow him I know I'll be okay and like that's yeah crazy. I saw that I saw I saw that quote too <laughs> yeah uh, but it is like but and also like though that approach too makes a lot of sense for this story mm-hmm. because essentially what it is is it's Joaquin showing up to watch his nephew who he's has a very sort of passing like general relationship mm-hmm. with They They don't seem to be They're like they close. haven't spent they a ton of time together. Similar, I don't think they live in yeah. the same city or anything. Yeah. Yeah. No. And so it's, it's that like him showing up to essentially babysit mm-hmm. with no real skills as like a parent or a, or a caretaker mm-hmm. and kind of looking to the kid to be like, okay, well how do I take care of you? Yeah. And and kind of like letting the kid sort of take the lead, which I think is an interesting dynamic because I think it also rings very true where like a lot of men mm-hmm. do not innately have the ability to know how to nurture. And, and I think a lot of times it's like the impulse to be like, well, what do you what do you just tell me what you need? Just tell me what you need. Yeah. When like a kid isn't always capable of being able to tell you. Right. And I think that that is such a fun thing that this movie explores of just like a kid just wanting a parent to know what they need and the parent not being able to and like breaking that barrier of like communication and and, and being comfortable with each other and knowing what each other need. And like they play that that sort of dynamic between Joaquin and, and Woody in such a cool way where like the kid is in the driver's seat for like the first half of the movie completely. Like the Mm -hmm. kid is like, is completely the master in the relationship. Until it becomes unsustainable. Yeah. And the stress that that creates for Joaquin, I think is, is so good. Johnny also, his name's Johnny in the movie. I don't know. I'm not great with character names. We know what we mean. (laughs) But it's like, yeah, I think that, and it's such a cool sort of setup for this whole thing because the dynamic that's immediately at play is the mom going to help the kid's dad and not really explaining it to him Mm -hmm. like not communicating exactly what's going on kind of keeping him in the dark and then bringing in his uncle who doesn't know how to parent also isn't aware of what's going on really Mm -hmm. or isn't as like tuned in with what's happening emotionally for his sister and there's so, so or many anyone. blind spots. Yeah. yeah. And everyone has all these blind spots, but they're still trying to do their best without like burdening, burdening each other with like what's going on. Mm-hmm. And like, and I think the cool thing about this movie is over the course of the movie, everyone being more comfortable with sharing their emotional, like the, mm-hmm. their emotions with each other and being more comfortable with the idea like of asking for what you need or what you want and saying out loud what is going on, what's yeah. wrong. Like, I think that that's like such a cool a cool place to start with this story because there is so much that's unspoken, mm-hmm. but it's it's played so great. Like you can tell that they that the brother sister have not really talked mm-hmm. in a long time. They've got a lot of stuff behind that wall, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they drop hints about what's happening there. Mm-hmm. And you can tell that like, the son really like likes his uncle, but they don't really know each other. Mm-hmm. And there's just, and you can also tell that the like relationship between the mom and the son is like almost like it feels a little like too much. Like I don't want to <laughs> say like it, it feels like it feels like she is very like invested in him in mm-hmm. in like potentially unhealthy ways or like mm. they all sort of are are the interpersonal relationships with everyone are so interesting and seeing how they play out throughout the movie is so is so great and yeah. it just feels like the the conceit of the movie of just like i have to go away 
for a, a, a reason I'm keeping essentially secret from my mm-hmm. son, you have to come and deal with his emotions around this thing that he doesn't really know or understand yet. But also, you're not equipped to really deal with it. Yeah. So, like, you're both figuring it out as you go. It was, ah, uh, it was just <laughs> such an, just such an interesting mm-hmm. story, like, such an interesting place to start. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so simple, but so layered at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. The really actual incredible. story mm-hmm. is so simple. I think that that's the thing that's so interesting about this movie is the actual plot is so simple. And all of what's interesting is born completely out of. Mm -hmm. the character dynamics Mm -hmm. and like the sort of interplay between all of these different characters who have so much baggage. What's interesting about the actual like um, action of this movie, the the stuff aside from the emotional levels is that this movie was based on or inspired by, I guess you would say, but it really is kind of based on this movie from 1974 called Alice in the Cities. Have you seen this Mm. movie? No, I haven't. So I watched it earlier, but I didn't quite finish it. I got like half an hour left. But the details of the overarching story are incredibly similar. So that movie Mm. is about like a man who's a writer and photographer um, who gets stuck with a child also with their mom goes away to deal with an ex and gets stuck with the child for a long time and travels to different Mm. cities with the child. So it is it's very similar in a lot of ways. It's also similar to Big Daddy, the classic (laughs) Adam Sandler movie. It's also in black and white. There's also, uh, I mean, even down to like, there's a bathroom scene that's the same with the kid being upset in the bathroom. There's a toothbrush Mm -hmm. thing. Like a lot of the things are very similar to that movie, but that movie does not have any of the emotional cues that this movie has. Yeah. So... I just, it was really interesting to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like what happens if you take a thing that already exists, but then like just like carve out all the insides and put all new stuffing in there. Yeah. It's pretty fascinating to watch. I think I'd recommend it. I just think it's really Mm. cool to watch them. I didn't finish it, but to watch them next to each other and see how similar and how different they are at the same time. Um, Mm. It was really cool. Check it out. Yeah. Oh, so one interesting thing that this child does, this child plays this game called the orphan game, which was very uh, interesting where he pretends that he's an orphan and whatever adult is around has some dead child that he wants to interview them (laughs) about. And that game actually came from Aaron Dessner's daughter, uh, Aaron Dessner from The National, wow. his daughter does that in real life. <laughs> so funny. It was so weird. Yeah. It was so weird, but also exactly the kind of weird shit that kids do. Mm-hmm. Like, like, because there's like no real reason for a lot of the like make believe that kids yeah. do. Yeah. It's just fun for them. And I also really like, I think like symbolically, this game is, that game for this kid is kind of interesting Mm-hmm. If you think about it in the context of like his relationship with right. his parents, yeah. it's like he is essentially when he's interviewing his parents about like their dead kid, he like it's like that's like such a weird thing. If you think about <laughs> it, like sort of sort of big picture, like what is he saying to you when he's saying, hey, you have a dead kid? Yeah. <laughs> like or conversely saying I have dead parents. Yeah. 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 That I'm an orphan and you like he's like I think it's like such an interesting way to sort of subtly hint at like, oh, the maybe the like family relationship here is a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, not great. Yeah. Where sorry I sorry to Aaron from the National for your family. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's happening in your real life. <laughs> hey, you know, you might need to have a sit down with your daughter, yeah. man, <laughs> uh, and and ask her what that's really about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, but because it did. It, I was kind of struck by the relationship between the kid and his mom and and mm-hmm. and questioned it like it felt like how can you be a good parent to your child when there's so much else pulling your head apart mm-hmm. like like in the beginning of the movie we also find out that like their their parents are dead mm-hmm. their mom is kind of recently yeah yeah their mom relatively recently and it was not a good thing Mm-mm. it caused tension which they don't really like outright tell you but there's a scene where they kind of like show you that like there was differing ways that the two of them sort of approached their parent their parent Mm -hmm. uh which resonated with me as well but like and that caused tension between them as a family and on top of that they also reveal like slowly what's going on with her 
husband, Mm ex-husband, partner. I'm not sure. They don't ever really explain exactly Mm -hmm. like what the dynamic. What their their marital status was. Yeah. Yeah. But like, (laughs) yeah, you like think about like a human being is only a human being. And when there's all that going on and you have a kid who's like constantly there, Mm -hmm. like how can you be a great parent to that kid, but also be dealing with all this other super heavy, high level emotional stress and I think that that game was like a, a little way to like show like, oh, you're, she is a, obviously a very loving and good mother, mm-hmm. but is also very obviously preoccupied emotionally with so much else. And that like game is basically to me was her son being like, hey, you're not doing exactly what you should be doing. For yeah. Me. And I think that when he like sort of explains that game to his uncle and his uncle's like, what? <laughs> like that to me, I think if I'm in that situation and and my nephew says that to me, I'm immediately connecting those dots. Mm-hmm. I'm being like, oh, this is a thing you entertain in your kid and like play this game and this is how your kid views you. I would I would immediately start connecting these dots and being like, oh, there's something. There's mm-hmm. something going on here. You would call child services. Absolutely. <laughs> Speed dial. <laughs> but it was like, I thought that was such an interesting way to like, not overtly say she's a bad mom because I don't think she was a bad mom. Mm-hmm. I think she's it was trying. just like yeah. she's trying really hard, but she is just pulled yeah. to pieces. And so, like that was like a subtle way of of her son begging for attention mm-hmm. from her, and the sort of spe- specifics of that sort of cry for attention hint at deeper issues, mm-hmm. which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, and I also loved like Joaquin's reaction to finding out that, that like that, like him being like, well, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to play this stupid game <laughs> with you. But then like ultimately at the end of the day, as every person who develops a relationship with a kid does, you realize, no, I ha-, like that is, that is the way that this kid connects. Yeah. Him inviting me into that world and me accepting that invitation mm-hmm. is key to Playing. sort of, yeah, to connecting. Mm-hmm which I thought they did such a great job of him slowly sort of getting drawn into the kid's mm-hmm. world. Yeah. Instead of just being that like curmudgeonly uncle who's just like, I'm not doing your stupid game, kid. <laughs> which uh, there are other uncles in my family that I could relate to if that was the way that they approached it. Uh, yeah. But it's good. It's so, it's the whole first, like the whole setup of this movie. I was just like, this is so interesting. Yeah. Like there's just so many little intricacies and things I never thought of. Yeah, they bring in the history of each of the characters in such a great way too because it's really easy to just like say out loud constantly like so often this is something that happens in movies all the time. Hi sister, do you remember how our dad was last yes. summer? You know, or yes. like whatever. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it can be so fucking corny and yeah. they really did it so tastefully and artistically in this film. And I think that like the thing that I loved about it and and this is like sort of moving further into the movie, but Mm -hmm. they do tell you what happened, Mm -hmm. but they also don't spoon feed you like their sort of takes on it. Like essentially the dynamic was the sister had a very tense relationship with their parents Mm -hmm. and the son was sort of. The favorite, a po- yeah, and 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 the sort of one who would just be like, "You're be you're it's to the sister, you're overreacting. They're mm-hmm. doing the best that they can." So like, they tell you that that was the dynamic, but they don't explain why. Mm-hmm. Like they don't go. It's not like they always liked you because you were the 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 right, artistic yeah. one and you, the, the blah blah blah. <laughs> it's just the detail you get is you you always take he always takes their sides and they always picked at her. Mm-hmm. They always told her that she was not doing things right. Yeah. And so you understand that, and that dynamic is so prevalent in so many different family relationships that mm-hmm. you're like, I totally Mine. get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But truly, it's like you you can see that, like, I mean, specifically, like in a lot of, I don't think anyone will listen to this that'll be upset that I say this out loud, but like my brother and I have like a very interesting relationship with our biological father that, the dynamic is pretty similar where like I've always kind of been the one who's like, Hey, come on, don't, don't be mean. Yeah. (laughs) And my brother is the one who's just like, I'm not being mean. I'm just being honest. Yeah. And so we have that like weird little triangle Mm -hmm. of like me and my brother have a similar thing, but I'm, I'm the one who's saying that, well, with our mom, but I'm the one who was always saying mom kind of sucks, but I'm also the one that me and mom never got along. 
And right. uh, my brother was the golden child. So you're the golden child yeah. here too. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but but I thought that was so so cool mm-hmm. because it immediately set up why they don't talk also. Yeah. Or like why they aren't communicative because I think at least that's part she of the is reason. constantly yeah. yeah she is constantly hurt by the relationship that he had with their parents mm-hmm. like i think that's the big thing it's like what she wants is to have positive relationships with all of these people but he's getting what she wants she's not getting what she wants mm-hmm. she's jealous of him for getting what she wants and so they're not like constantly talking about it but you're carrying that with you yeah in every interaction with that person. Mm -hmm. Like so, and that's kind of to hint at what I was saying before about like how every interaction is tinted with both positive and negative where like you love that person, but you're pissed or you, you hate that person, but you also love them. You know, it's like, and they play that dynamic so well Mm -hmm. and they, uh, and the shifting of that dynamic as the movie goes on into like a mutual understanding where they both seem to finally see eye to eye in a way that is like, so satisfying yeah so i guess part of how we find out what's going on with the dad character too is through a book by polar bears that they read so throughout the movie there are like three or four of these times where they insert a text and all the text excerpts that are in this film are from female authors i don't know if you noticed that but i didn't that's something that mike mills has also done he did that in beginners as well too with uh mm. runaway rabbit or what is that what it's called <laughs> something like that anyway i can't remember it's just a really gorgeous way to kind of use the words of others to punctuate his story and mm-hmm. accentuate the emotion of what's going on and like give you the like breadcrumb yeah too give you like the i think that's like that's like such a, a more interesting mm-hmm. way to tell me that this kid's dad is bipolar. Yeah. Then then it would be for the kid's mom to be like Well, his bipolar's acting. Uh, yeah, up. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's having a bipolar episode. Yeah. It's like yeah. Mm-hmm. But isn't it like way more interesting to like also see how the family deals with this? Mm-hmm. Like that to me is so much more interesting than like Joaquin being like, What's wrong? And her being like, Well, you know, his dad's bipolar is acting <laughs> yeah. up. It's like so much more interesting for me to get the like color of Mm -hmm. the way that this family has talked about this problem in the past. Yeah. It's like, oh, they they have tried to sort of communicate what it means Mm -hmm. to this kid, but in the like sort of kid terms that he can understand. I thought that was so smart. Because yeah. you you immediately know what's going on. You understand how big it is as well. I think that's like another thing that like is important to me. You understand like how once you find out that this kid's dad is bipolar, you sort of see the like how large this sort of could loom over their family. Mm-hmm. Like that's a huge deal. Like his mom's not just dealing with like being separated and being a single right. parent. She has a lot more on her yeah. shoulders. Yeah. And it also and it also like humanizes the dad and makes you empathize with him in a way that like so few movies would would make the that relationship that complicated Mm -hmm. where it's like they are not together but they're not not together because they don't love each other right they're they are not together because he is in a mental state that he he needs to get himself together right in order to be able to like properly exist in these relationships it's like a very interesting interesting, yeah relationship to even examine that we really don't see represented that often um someone having like a mentally ill parent who's who is having serious mental illness yeah and and that another shades of gray relationship of like a ex ex quote-unquote husband or like a separated sort of spouse Mm -hmm. like that relationship of like i still like have deep feelings for this person Mm -hmm. But like they are in a place where they can't sort of provide what I need from a partner. Right. But I'm still invested in them. Like emotionally, that's like I can't even imagine. Yeah. Like the place that she's in as a, as a person. In and that if moment. nothing else, she wants her son to have a father. So like exactly. even despite whatever her feelings are for him too, there's that additional layer of yeah. I need this man to be around if if only for my son to have a father. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's so, it's <laughs> just so, so, uh, yeah, man. And then all, when they show, they show like the little clips of like 
him and his son like playing mm-hmm. together and like you see like where the son's like imagination comes from yeah in the way that he interacts with his dad and it just like makes it all make so much sense right that was really gorgeous too like treating his dad or showing sides of his dad that aren't just his mental illness as well mm-hmm. that yeah. there are like sometimes he's normal (laughs) yeah sometimes he's normal he's nice he's sweet he's funny he's a whole person besides his mental illness as well yeah i'm really glad that was addressed it's just uh yeah it's gorgeous yeah absolutely yeah it was such a uh, such a great Mm -hmm. layer to the story yeah um referring to back to um that all the authors who wrote all the pieces that are used in this film being women mike mills said that he really wanted to decenter his viewpoint Uh, or his artistic voice in certain areas, and that also the men in this movie are always referring back to the woman. They're referring back to Mm. the mom. So even though the majority of the time you are watching two male characters on screen, um, the female and maternal presence throughout the movie is sort of omniscient. Like, she's always there. You feel her there. You feel, like, even just, like, the safety of knowing if something goes wrong we can call her and she'll know mm-hmm. what to do. That was something that I noticed was how frequently she's relied on. And yeah, and a interest in communication too. Mm-hmm. Like specifically, I even clocked it as the movie was going on. I was like, there's so many scenes that are phone calls yeah. between Joaquin and his sister. Or texts. Where Yeah, mm-hmm. or texts, yeah, where you're just like, oh, like, like he is essentially just like a custodian of this <laughs> kid right mm-hmm. now. Like he is like, constantly like looking up to her being like what do i what do i do yeah. what do i do and she's like you're fine do this mm-hmm. and he's like okay i'm fine let's do it but it is like it, it literally even just from like a script standpoint uh her voice is heard throughout the entire movie even though she's not physically present mm-hmm. until the last scenes yeah but her presence is in the it's whole movie there. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah. And they both both are constantly aware of it. He's constantly thinking about how she'll react to him calling and being like, I lost, I lost him. Yeah. yeah. Like, or whatever. It's like, like that in his brain is all, he's always answering to her. He's always sort of referring back to her to be like, am I doing okay? Is this okay? Am I, is everything yeah. all right? And that hearing now that that was something that Mike Mills was doing intentionally. I'm like, oh, it makes so much more sense now Yeah, that there was so much communication and using women's voices to connect parts of the story or connect characters throughout the story as well too yeah yeah very cool Mm -hmm. yeah that's great and speaking of the texts too i like just um physically how the text messaging was handled in this film it's always interesting Mm -hmm. because everyone does it differently um but i feel like the way that they handled that in this film was so inobtrusive yeah so casual the way Mm -hmm. the way maybe a normal text message would feel (laughs) yeah in 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 even just the visual presentation of it i love that there weren't like crazy sound effects yeah no sounds. there weren't like sounds there Mm -hmm. wasn't the text wasn't in like a uh, iphone bubble it was literally just (laughs) it was literally just the text it looked like a subtitle almost yeah yeah and like and and i will say the first time it happened i was confused for half a second Mm -hmm. i was just like wait what's oh it's a text Mm -hmm. like but i liked that of just like oh this is how they're gonna do it yeah uh because you you clock it the first time and then from then on it just it's never distracting you yeah also from like sort of experiencing the frame absolutely yeah uh it's just the information you need Mm -hmm. and also literally just the words that they use to communicate with each other like it felt so underwritten in in a great way. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think a lot of times in like texts in movies, it's like very like pointed exposition of just like be at this place at right. this time. I will be there with this. <laughs> what do you think? That sounds great. I'll do that. It's like it was like when we text, particularly people who you have like that shorthand with. Just right. like it's it's just four words and no punctuation. Right. Like that. Like it's just information. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it kind of like flies under the radar, but and you they're even cracking it. jokes back and forth, razzing each other. Yeah, yeah. it's cute. It's great. Yeah, oh, it's it was great. Yeah, <laughs> I, I something else that drives me nuts in films is the sound of vibrating phones because they're always just the most loud noise in the room, no matter mm-hmm. where the phone is in the scene. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like it's on like a loose glass table, <laughs> even right in when front it's of just a like in somebody's pocket. <laughs> yeah. It's like. 
<laughs> no, everyone, that's not what a vibrating no. phone sounds like. If it sounds like anything. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, I, you, if my phone is sitting on the table even right here next to me, I don't think you'd hear it if it vibrated. Yeah, my phone's been going like, off this whole time and <laughs> yeah. I haven't heard a peep. Yeah. <laughs> it is always very interesting to see how people handle technology yeah. in movies. Mm -hmm. Like, I like that this, el the element of like, the like iPad and, and like screen time mm -hmm. was a thing yeah. in this movie. Mm -hmm. I like that that's like part of the, because that is such a part of like parenting these days. It's like, right. do we let our Buzzwords. kids look at these, mm -hmm. these things or do we not? And a lot of times that shit feels so cringy to me in <laughs> movies. There's like a few uh -huh. things that always feel super cringy to me and it's in movies and it's always like zeitgeisty, like cultural sort of like, norms mm -hmm. so like texting or like cell phone stuff making jokes about cell phones i'm like i normally like hate it i also hate reading scripts where it talks about like so and so takes a huge rip from a bong <laughs> like like people like doing uh -huh. egregious drug use for the just to like show that they're like funny teenagers yeah like that kind of stuff always feels so like goofy to me mm -hmm. but i think like this was such a real like like and i think to the same degree that a parent being like stay off your phones kids yeah like it's <laughs> such an overdone trope mm -hmm. but in this movie it, it felt exactly how parents deal with that mm -hmm. in real life today yeah like like a good parent i think doesn't the, the issue with it normally is that it's not natural the way it's addressed that's yeah. that's usually where your issue is, is that it's corny yeah. because it's not natural. Yeah, and the way they handle in this, it in this film is so natural. It's real. Yeah, yeah. it's just a part of their life mm -hmm. as opposed to like ever drawing attention to it. It's yeah. just like it's it's just a thing that is mentioned in Normal passing Normal people a few times. just pull their phones out of their pockets constantly and look at something and put it back. They don't go, oh, my cell phone is vibrating. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Or like, yeah, if their kids are watching something, it's like, well, be careful, kids. It's going to ruin your brain. Yeah. Like, <laughs> no, it's like, I also like that in a, a real true thing in the way that we like sort of approach screens these days is it is like a distraction. And mm -hmm. like when there are moments in the movie where like Joaquin is like, just like, just let him watch something. Like mm -hmm. just look, put something on the tablet. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and that is like so real. Yeah. Like that is like, I have my, my siblings who have kids. It's like, if there's, if they need their kid to like pay attention Leave to something for, for a, a little bit of time, they're just like, Hey, put something on here. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, but it's not, yeah, they just didn't make a whole show of it mm -hmm. ever. It was just people existed in a world where technology is a thing that we use mm -hmm. instead of it being about that. Yeah. Whereas so many, I feel like just it's just so easy, especially with kids, the like joke of like, the kid loves the iPad is like <laughs> so done. <laughs> just like let kids have iPads in movies. It's Who just even the cares? Thing. Yeah. Who cares? I'm also the kind of person where I'm just like, iPads exist. We can't act like kids are never going to look at them. So just make sure your kids aren't looking at like weird stuff, but let them. And if they are, just around. answer their questions. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Just don't be don't be scared of having to talk to your kids about that stuff. I think like I don't know. It feels like people forget that like we were also once kids who watched TV from morning till night. Yeah, <laughs> like I watched. I literally watched Beavis and Butthead with my hand on the dial. <laughs> Because my phone, my TV had a dial. Mm -hmm, a knob I watched Beavis and Butthead standing in front of the TV <laughs> with so my hand it. on the knob <laughs> so that if my parents came into the room, I could change it like immediately. Flip it to Power Rangers or something. Truly, yeah. I would go from like, because MTV was like channel 31. <laughs> and then like, I would like just like change it to like channel 14, which was like QVC or something. Yeah. <laughs> Can't be upset that I'm watching QVC, mom. <laughs> I'm sure you got away with that one. <laughs> uh, the funny thing is, I guarantee you, my mom knows that we were watching like yeah. bad stuff all the time. <laughs> but as kids, we were just like, "Oh yeah, she never knew. <laughs> she never knew we were watching movies and butthead." But if I like went back and asked her right now, she's like, "Oh no, I could hear it in my bedroom." I know. Like, <laughs> kids are so dumb. We're like, "I know." You see, <laughs> like, we're like, getting away with it. As an adult now, you can look at kids lying, obviously, and be like, "God, I did that so many times." <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought, thought my I got parents away. really. I oh, really I thought away I got with it. Away. <laughs> but we not. We weren't. We're we never were. Fucking idiots. <laughs> yeah, not even once. Not even once. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
kind of embarrassing yeah. in retrospect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and yeah, just in terms of, I guess, the rest of the way that this movie looks, we haven't really talked about because we're talking about how the text, texts look. Texts. <laughs> Sorry to <Tech-its>. say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's. it's obviously in black and white. Mike Mills described using the black and white aspect in this movie as having a pliable sort of softness where you can kind mm-hmm. of enter the image and the image isn't yelling at you like a soft song. I just yeah. thought that was like a gorgeous thing that he said. And it's so true. Mm-hmm. Like, like because I think that like, particularly because a lot of this movie is on like busy streets or like Mm -hmm. busy like there's like scenes at like the venice boardwalk where they're like walking down the boardwalk and it's like that is such a loud place like visually Mm -hmm. but there's something about the black and white that like you really can can focus on the things that you know you're supposed to look at Mm -hmm. and and everything else becomes like texture and like yeah like atmosphere in a way that like if that's a full color image on the venice boardwalk there is millions of colors and millions of things that are just like drawing your eye around Mm -hmm. but instead you're what you're looking at is a kid walking around with a boom pole with a huge like windscreen (laughs) on it like like because that's just where your eye is drawn it's the most unique part of the image Mm -hmm. instead of the thing that's the loudest Mm -hmm. uh and it's the same thing like when they're in in new york on the streets in new york where it's just like there's so much else to look at but the thing that we're drawn to is the kid the kid. Uh, mm-hmm. The kid. We're always like brought back to him because he also has such a fun look. His hair is so like and his eyes shaggy and long. Oh and he, yeah, and his big <laughs> coat. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's like yeah, the black and white just kind of lets you take in everything as opposed to taking in the elements of it. I think yeah. there is no distraction. It's just you kind of look at it. Everything kind of also feels, for some reason, in black and white, things feel so composed to me. Mm-hmm. Because you're, it's really at that point is just about composition and like the shape of the frame as opposed right. to like color or anything like that. And so it is like very easy to kind of tell your audience where to look mm-hmm. because it's in, in how you compose the shot. And and they do do such a great job. Like some yeah. of those like big sort of street scenes and like the Venice boardwalk scene, it's in the trailer, like where he's just walking down the boardwalk with the boom pole. It's just such a cool shot. Mm-hmm. And then like him on the beach with the big boom pole. It's like such a striking image. And the camera work is so simplified too so that you're not mm-hmm. distracted by that either. Mm-mm. It really is just super focused on these two yeah. characters. Really nicely Sound-wise composed too. like centered shots. Yeah. When they're in oh, yeah. these like huge areas where there are like tons of people, there are buses honking by, there's like all kind of crap going on. I feel like the world noise even is like a little muted. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think and I think of that is intentional because also there's like moments where Joaquin's character as a guy who records sound yeah. uh, for a living, Joaquin's character explains sort of audio recording to yeah. the kid mm-hmm. about like how like where he's just like, you want the sound of the train, you got to point the mic at the train. Like, like mm-hmm. you want to hear that, but you're pointing over here. And so there is such an attention to like the practicality of recording sound. And we hear so frequently a like dry close up voice into a microphone in the context of like a big noisy shot Mm -hmm. that like I think it is like intentional to be like the thing that we're always hearing in these moments is a very focused small dry the dry sound of these two people interacting in this like bigger world yeah so instead of making like a New York street sound like the New York street we all know Mm -hmm. what we're hearing is the, the New York street background noise on a podcast recorded on the street in New York, where it's right. like we're hearing these people with that as like just sort of a backdrop instead of it being like, wow, New York's crazy. It's like, <laughs> no, we're two people in this sort of setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's the same thing like at, at in like the, the like sh- shots on like Venice Beach, where yeah. it's like we're hearing, we're very purposefully hearing the things that I think he wants us to hear. And so all of these different layers are sort of working mm-hmm. together so beautifully to just yeah. bring your focus to these two people, no matter where yeah. they are. Yeah. Or or in those moments where he really wants you to hear the waves. Mm-hmm. It's because the kid is like, the kid is hearing the waves. We're almost always hearing the like headphone mix, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is super cool because there's also those moments where we hear the kid talking straight into the microphone mm-hmm. and it gets like, has this You have an like, actual microphone. <laughs> 
Yeah. I you know, were pantomiming in microphone. <laughs> but like w- we hear this, you know, we hear the like lips on the microphone uh-huh. in certain moments because that is the world that this, this movie is like yeah. existing in where that is how the sound is being captured. Yeah. And it's so, uh, it's and it's so smooth sounding. Yeah. I think that's like the and the trailer too has that vibe mm-hmm. where it's like it feels like somebody took the sound and then just like sanded it down <laughs> to where it's this like beautiful like soft edged. I don't know, it, that visually makes sense to me that it's just mm-hmm. this like very beautifully sanded like sculpture that's like very like smooth and has cool little lines and it's all <laughs> it doesn't have that like bite yeah that like i think a lot of like city scenes have like Mm -hmm. where it feels like overbearing the music too is very sort of chill and unobtrusive when there's Mm -hmm. score behind it yeah it's really uh it's like a hug it really (laughs) truly is like a hug like it's just such a warm movie for a movie that Mm -hmm. deals with such intense emotional stuff it really does like do it in such a way that you are constantly like sort of being warmed like your seats on your seat is you got a seat warmer the whole time. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah. yeah it's Bun's so toasty as hell. Hell yeah. <laughs> My butt is hot. <laughs> and that's how you know it's a good movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the hotter your butt is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the closer you are to God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they do Joaquin does start to fall in love with this boy as we've said their relationship sort of yeah. progresses and they do very quickly go to new york city together yeah boys he's, first he's got to go to work he's got to work mm-hmm. he can't get out of it i also really loved the the like like him sort of giving in to the kid mm-hmm. and then begging for permission from the kid's <laughs> mom which i think is yeah. exactly how it goes like absolutely you can't break the kid's heart after you gave him no. the hope yeah no. yeah and he doesn't know because he's not a parent to not do that <laughs> Yeah, he's just like literally I whatever you want, kid. Yeah. I'll do whatever you want for you to not be sad and cry. Mm-hmm. But then yeah, yeah, so they go, yeah, they go to New York cuz he has to do more of these interviews and we hear more of these interviews, which mm-hmm. I think is so it's again going back to what we were saying, the, these sort of moments of popping back into these interviews with the kids. Mm-hmm. Uh are so nice to sort of settle this settle into the new scene of of a new place. Like I feel like in the New York section is like kind of where he like really starts to understand what it means to like love a kid or like love like to have that kind of like unconditional Mm -hmm. yes he's like learning to be a nurturer because Mm -hmm. this is like where his like he's tested yeah where (laughs) where it's a foreign place for this kid the kid doesn't know anything about this place kids also reacting to traveling a lot differently than an adult might oh yeah and like the idea that the kid is in control in a place that he's comfortable with is fine. But when yeah. a kid makes choices in a place that they don't understand, mm-hmm. like for example, this, there's the big, I think like the big scene in New York, the big sort of thing is, is in the drugstore. Mm-hmm. They're going to buy a toothbrush because the kid forgets his toothbrush, mm-hmm. which I did all the co- time as a kid <laughs> on purpose because I didn't want to brush my freaking teeth. <laughs> I would pretend that I forgot my br- toothbrush. Uh huh. So that was very true to me. So I don't have one, so I don't have to brush. <laughs> <Yes>. Obviously. <laughs> uh, but then. How are your teeth now? Awful. Normal? Awful. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. n- awful. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, they're fine. Uh, <laughs> But then, yeah, like that that scene in the grocery store of like they go to this like convenience store and he's like buying him a toothbrush. He like turns away for like two seconds and the kid disappears. It's like mm-hmm. also that is exactly what ha- like kids do that yeah. all the time. Like my nephew's done that to me before where we were just like together and then I turn away and I'm just like and that like pit that you feel in your stomach. Yeah. It's happened to me with other like pe- friends' dogs too, or like, like I'm watching a friend's dog and I like let it outside and then I like. So you're call constantly it. borrowing people's um, pets and People, children just yes, to pets lose and them, children. <laughs> just to yeah. feel something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it is like that's like that first f- the first time that his like sort of he's he's like tested as a as a nurturer. Yeah. And he feels like he failed, and his reaction to that, the anger right. that he feels towards the kid, I think is a really interesting moment. Because when he does find him, he yells at him. Yeah, yeah, and and he and and he realizes, like I think, in that moment, that blaming the kid and being angry at the kid is like pretty much the wrong response. Yeah, because it's like it's the kid. The kid is being a kid, and you can't like. It's almost like when you get angry at a dog, you're not. T- you don't teach the dog not to do the thing that they did that you're mad about. You teach them to be scared of you in that context. Mm-hmm. 
And I think that that in parenting is the case too. It's like when kids you, are just bigger dogs. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Kids are just two legged big dogs. <laughs> but like, it's like, yeah, like I think, and that's a thing about the relationship with the mother that I think is interesting in this is, is that thing of like, she strikes me as the kind of mother who doesn't get outwardly angry at, at him. Like, or you feel like she's the kind of mom who would be like upset if she found out that he yelled at him. But then when they talk about it, She's like, hey, man, like, it's okay. Like, kids do that. Like, mm -hmm. it happens. Like, you don't, yeah, don't beat yourself up yeah. about it. We're all just doing the best that we can. Yeah. And I think that that is like, that is, so, I loved that moment between them. And she even says, like, sometimes I fucking hate him. Even though I yeah. love him, I want him to shut the hell up. I want, you know, yeah. so I've yeah. hollered at him. It feels like shit, but like, it happens. Yeah. Yeah. And that I think is like the first moment to me, not the first moment, but that is like a moment where I think their relationship as like brother and sister really starts to like come around mm -hmm. because I think they're connecting on something that they can both really sort of identify with in that moment. And then I think that it also opens the door for him to talk to her more yeah. about how he feels in this situation. And she also in these moments is opening up to him about what's going on with, mm -hmm. with his dad, the kid's dad. So it's like through these moments of like fear and like negative emotions, they're both like slowly getting comfortable with the idea of talking to each other. Yeah. Like, re like really talking to each other. And he's beginning to empathize with her experience in like a very visceral and real way. Yeah. In a way yeah. that you couldn't... By just somebody telling you what their experience is. He's very, yeah. he's living it. Yeah. And it's almost like literally if you're just like, oh, I got so scared today. I almost lost your kid. <laughs> and then the response is like, oh yeah, kids are wild. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm in absolute <laughs> chaos up here because of this yeah. other like real serious issue that I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. I think it like, it, it really does like sort of soften both of them to start seeing each other more it, with more humanity. Mm -hmm. And like they start to be able to empathize with each yeah. other in like a, 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 a way that they previously hadn't because they had been so afraid of communicating. I think that that's like really what this movie is about to me yeah. is about getting comfortable with talking about stuff yeah. that isn't, that isn't comfortable. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and, and not letting like sort of like, I think I deal with this a lot in my real life of just like setting up a situation where like I talk to this person about this thing in this way and no other way. Mm -hmm. uh, my relationship with this person is very much this dynamic. And like this movie in a lot of ways, I think to me is about like breaking down those barriers of just like, well, I don't want to, I've never really talked to my sister about these things that like that she's going through or I'm going through. She's never really talked to me about these other things. We've never had that kind of relationship. So we never can. Mm hmm. But like this experience in this movie and this moment in particular, I feel like is the first little like chisel into the stone of that, of being like, hey, no, no, no. Whatever your relationship was before, it's like never too late to like foster something deeper and more meaningful. Yeah. And they both like, yeah, can kind of see each other more fully in this moment where it's like he's finally telling her about something that's making him sad and she's opening about what's making her just in chaos and they're they kind of bond on their sort of insecurities as well yeah. in that moment like he yeah. says something like like i don't know what the fuck i'm doing and she's like yeah. nobody knows <laughs> yeah like, you just have yeah. to keep doing it that's all yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah so. and that's the hey that's great advice yeah I mean, literally nobody knows what the hell they're doing literally you have, nobody you have to keep going yeah. <laughs> i sure don't no hell no <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just doing shit every day and hoping it's cool i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I hope this is cool. And if it's not, we learn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so after all of that, the kid does end up with the singing toothbrush that he wanted, <laughs> which I thought was just a funny little button to that moment. I, yeah. yeah. And of course, of course, you mm -hmm. give him what he wants. Yeah. You're terrified that you almost lost him. So you give him exactly what he wants. Mm -hmm. And so now that Joaquin has had this like deep emotional sort of experience with his sister, soon after that... I mean, the boy is really starting to kind of lose it. Like, he's out here in this mm -hmm. weird space. He's got all this stuff going on he doesn't know how to deal with. He kind of lashes out at his mom in that moment and says she's mm -hmm. a terrible mom. And uh, Joaquin is 
very defensive of her in that moment and yeah. kind of as a viewer i think you are too <laughs> like, yeah weirdly you're like yeah don't talk oh, shit about her do you know yeah. what she's going do you through? know what she's going through oh that's right you don't oh you don't that's right you don't you don't know you don't know exactly what she's going through okay that hmm. was just such like it was really interesting to me that i felt that way emotionally mm-hmm. in that moment like mm-hmm. <laughs> it's cool that you don't it made even you know that kid yeah come on woody and how many times i mean how many times have you heard a single mom say like you don't know what i've done for you etc yeah uh, speaking from my own single mom <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. and uh yeah i don't know it just uh it was interesting yeah and i and i i think they do a really good job in this this sort of run of scenes from the moment that mm-hmm. he sort of gets lost for the first time yeah really through through the the sort of next few scenes and then when they eventually go to new orleans which spoiler alert they they go down to new orleans <laughs> uh but like through this scene these this group of scenes they do a really good job of like showing how this kid's really unable to deal with mm-hmm. his emotions like he he isn't able to process them and in in his inability to process what he's going through it is these constant moments of lashing out and like being defiant and being like difficult Mm -hmm. just basically like begging begging an adult to fix it you know it's like it's like that i think is like kids don't know and he's just like whatever i just need something to be different like yeah. i need it to be different mm-hmm. and he does such a great job in performing these oh my God. this like run of scenes yeah. like like you really feel for this kid of just like man somebody needs to just like this kid just needs love and and he needs to know that he's going to be okay because yeah. i think nobody is telling him he's going to be okay they're kind of just like distracting him he, like like the whole mm-hmm. thing with with Joaquin in this chunk is like <laughs> not not addressing the elephant in the room which is that this kid is like not able to like deal with like the gravity of his right. situation and instead which is like oh you want to you want to go to new york yeah let's go to new york yeah. oh you yeah, you want you're going to come down to new orleans <laughs> you want pizza literally yeah. it's like 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 instead of being like what's going on man like yeah. what's happening what what like talk to me it's just that constant like distraction it's like we're going to do this and other thing and he probably feels and senses too that something deeper is going on with his dad and his mom yep. and and he just wants somebody mm-hmm. to tell him he wants somebody to talk to him like an adult like a yeah. like a person mm-hmm. uh he wants people to like stop treating him like a kid and like let him in on yeah. all this stuff that's going on because yeah like what the next the next after the get, he gets lost or he like gets lost in the drugstore there's another moment where he like runs and just like jumps on a bus mm-hmm. Which is like, like to me, that's like literally the the biggest cry for attention, yeah. or, or for like, there's something wrong. Like literally, I want to run away from you. Mm-hmm. But like, instead of digging into that at all, literally, Joaquin is just like sits next to him on the bus, hugs, like I'm here, I'm here now. We mm-hmm. then they're like, we're gonna go. I'm sending you. He's like, I can't handle it. I can't handle this. Yeah. I'm sending you home. Basically, like I don't. Somebody else has to deal with this. Mm -hmm. And so, again, instead of addressing what's going on, what's emotionally going on with this kid, he's kind of just like, I don't know. Let's just ignore it, Mm -hmm. which I think is such a real uh, human response to these things sometimes is to just run away from the the problem instead of trying to fix it. Yeah. Especially if it's an emotional issue. (laughs) Oh, yeah. It's like somebody else can handle this. I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go to New Orleans and and record my radio show. Do my little podcast. Yeah. (laughs) Like really. And then, and I loved, I loved that, like how that ends up. Mm -hmm. So when he's sending him home, the kid, I I also love that the way, the way he gets out of it is like, I have to poop. Yeah. Which like, (laughs) I have to poop now. (laughs) Yes. I, and I have multiple experiences as a kid of that (laughs) actual situation of Mm -hmm. like being with like my dad or whatever. And just being like, I have to go. I have to go now. And him be like, what do you mean you have to go now? I was like, I have to find a bathroom. Yeah. So like that (laughs) moment I rang so true to me. But then also, yeah, like like this is a different thing. But as a kid, I would I would fake a problem to get attention from the person I wanted attention from. Mm -hmm. Like there was multiple times. Like it's when kids pretend to be sick or they like say they have a stomach ache so they don't have to go to school, so their mom will will stay home with them for the day. It's like that's what that is. It's like, no, I want to be with you. I want you. I need you mm-hmm. to be here with me. And the only way I know how to do that is to make you think I'm like sick. 
mm-hmm. basically. And I think that that like is exactly how kids act. Like yeah. they they just say whatever they think will get them the attention that they want. And that in that moment, he's already in sort of a stressful situation because they're in New York City, which is just stressful on its own. They're in a taxi. Mm-hmm. They're on their way to the airport to catch a flight. So like yeah. there's there's so much going on in this moment when he's like, we need to pull over and go to the bathroom <laughs> yeah. now, which also, also bathrooms I, hard to come by. You know? Yeah. And I didn't know that you could just ask a cab to pull over and wait for you. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I never would have thought of that. I guess to you just be like, wait out here. I don't know if I would trust them to stay with all my bags and crap in the car. Yeah, no way. <laughs> no way. All that expensive no podcasting way. gear? Yeah. No way. <laughs> but yeah, I, th- I thought that that was a great moment too of, mm-hmm. of him like sort of even realizing that the kid is like lying. Mm-hmm. I think this is like the sort of moment where even Joaquin's character realizes like, okay, I can't like run away from this kid. I have to like get this kid to to open up to me and like talk to him about this stuff. Yeah. Because like I think that that, when he finally is like, I am not going to send you home. Yeah. You're going to come with me into New Orleans. Like this run of scenes, I think, is sort of where Joaquin starts talking to this kid like he's a real kid or like a real person almost like telling him about like his ex. Yeah. And like, like, why, Louisa. why don't you and my mom? Yeah. <laughs> why don't you and my mom talk? He's yeah. like, it was probably this. It was probably like, it, it's a lot of things. It's like, this is the moment where we start to sort of realize like, oh, like, Joaquin has a lot of stuff he's not dealing with too. And now this kid is forcing him to think about like yeah. not dealing with the things that he needs to deal with. To, to think about his relationships uh, with others and his place in the world and how his personality and his choices are so affecting to this child. When somebody yeah. fully relies on you for their every need, <laughs> yeah, um, that he's not really had that before. And then- yeah. Even these small choices can leave a, a permanent mark, maybe, or or a really yeah. tough mark on this child now. Well, yeah. well, it, it's literally like that question, the question the kid asks him, like, or when he says, like, you won't remember any of this stuff, mm-hmm. like, like basically from this trip, like that, like that is like such a, 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 a interesting, like, sort of psychological question for the two of them, where like. For the kid, this is such a huge, this trip, this whole experience Mm -hmm. is like so gigantic. And he even says, if I'm not mistaken, don't eventually he says like, when I said like, I was talking about, I won't remember any of this, but you like, or you, I can't remember the dynamic, but he basically like flips it. The kid wouldn't remember any of this, but that Joaquin would. He would. And he would remind him. Yeah, later. That's which later sets movie, up but... a, oh, but it's a beautiful, <laughs> it's so, oh my God. That was like the fourth time I cried in the movie. I I think I probably cried through like 80 to 90% of the movie. <laughs> Both I mean, it's, times. It, it hits you. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I don't even so know hard. why. Yeah, no, me either. You know? I don't ever know why I'm crying. I'm just like, oh, it's here. Like, yeah. Uh, I mean, sometimes like something emotional does happen and you're like, wow, that really hit. But sometimes I'm just like, I don't, I don't know in this moment what is making me emotional, but I am so emotional. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the sign of a really great story. A piece of art, a real piece of yeah. art. Like you're yeah, just looking at it. Yeah, that it just it affects it's, you it's because you're looking you. at it. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. Um, when they go from from after he fakes having to poop, he's just like, "I'm not gonna send you home. <laughs> Let's go to New Orleans." Uh-huh. And we like hear from more kids who've dealt with like real trauma. Yeah, like in these interviews are like kids who have like literally been through like hurricanes that have devastated their communities, Mm -hmm. but they're all still like crazy optimistic. Yeah. And like they say such like, like things where you're just like, wow, okay, I guess there is hope. But then like, yeah. So like in, in the whole new Orleans scene, I think this is like, this is like the moment where to me, they're like kind of relying, like they're now kind of relying on each other. Yeah. In in a lot of ways, like they're connected now. Mm -hmm. And I think the test that we get sort of put through in this, this scene is when they, he presumably has some sort of cardiac episode of some kind. <laughs> the fainting. Something happens. Mm-hmm. He faints. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just a fainting. But that, like, that is like the sort of acute reminder that like this kid is like under his care, and if he goes down, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like this kid has no one kind of in this moment. Yeah. Because there's some so much else going on, and I think it's like that moment when you're sort of faced with the thing you have become attached to going away, mm-hmm. what does that feel like? Yeah. Uh, 
And I think that that's like the sort of the break, right? Like that's mm-hmm. where like. Or it's pretty close to it before he starts acknowledging his own feelings. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, where he's like, like, like that, because that basically leads into like right immediately after that is when we find out that like things are going okay with the dad, right? What happens in between there is that the boy finally does that interview. So the whole right. movie, Joaquin's been trying to get him to answer the interview questions that he's asking the other yes. children. Yes, yes. And the yes. boy's kind of like, no, basically. <laughs> or or turning it back on Joaquin and asking him the hard-hitting questions. Yeah. Um, so in between the fainting and, you know, whatever else happens the rest of the movie, the boy just sits down with that mic that he loves <laughs> and does his end of the interview sort of alone or yeah. just with himself asking the question and answering it. Yeah, he asks himself, like, what he sees happening in the future, I think. And uh, that's when we get the, the titular line, of course. Which which to me is like so cool yeah. that that perspective comes from the kid. Yeah. Of like you sit and you make plans and you want certain things to happen, mm-hmm. but ultimately nothing that you thought would happen happens and th- everything that happens is stuff you didn't stuff you, you never, never would have expected. Stuff you never thought would happen. Could happen, happens. yeah. What, it, what it even, how does he get so it? So you like have to come on, just, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on, come on. And it's in that this this kind of straight into the <laughs> microphone sound uh-huh. that we've been hearing so much. Yeah. And it's like so like uh it's so cool that the kid has that perspective to me. Yeah. That the kid is the one who is like saying like this is all chaos. Like life is chaos. Mm-hmm. We have to just like power through it and do the best that we can. And like the whole time Joaquin and the kid's mom are like struggling with that chaos of just like, mm-hmm. we have to fix it. We have to do better. We have to be, we have to be better for this kid. We have to know the answers. And the kid is like sitting there being like, you don't and you never will. Yeah. You just have to like roll with it. Something else they said before that was um, when they were doing an orphan game right before that, Joaquin asked him, him as the orphan child character. Um, if he remembers his mother and he starts listing all these things that she does it's gorgeous you cry and he says something like mom says even though we love each other like we'll never know everything about each other and that's just the way it is (laughs) you're crying it gave me a little it gave me one of these it gave me one of those little those little up the spine moments because they also the way that that monologue too when he's like saying that we're seeing those like sort of little flashes of her like and we're it's crying, just so beautiful. We're seeing them yeah, tears. we're bawling. Yeah. We're realizing that like this kid, he's just like so deeply. There is such deep love. Yeah, through deep like all of the chaos. It's like it's like their life is utter chaos, but like they love each other so much because of the chaos. Almost like they're there each other with each other. Yeah, and they're just like weathering the like the storm of it all together. Absolutely, and and also through that. Joaquin's character um, is getting to know his own sister through her child Mm -hmm. in a different Mm -hmm. way than he's known her before. And probably the child thought that he would be the one getting to know his mother in a different way, you know? Yeah, Um, yeah. But that was maybe like an an unexpected consequence of their relationship too. And they also in this, in this around the same time is when he has the conversation with the mother. Like your son asked why we don't talk mm-hmm. and yeah. then and then he kind of is just like it's all this stuff right yeah and then they're both kind of just like yeah and you they get say, this wow, like, like you've never addressed that before yeah, but yeah you've never talked about it yeah. but it is yeah it's all this stuff mm-hmm. and it is like that's that thing of like damn what if we just told each other what if we just told each <laughs> other th- this stuff when we were feeling it and what if we like worked through this like emotional stuff together instead of like hiding from it and like distracting ourselves with like work or with Mm-hmm. all this other crap what if we just like address the things that were tough and work through them with the people that are around us like so much of our lives are wasted avoiding a hard conversation or avoiding mm-hmm. dealing with a feeling or made more complicated by or ma- doing yeah those right yeah or, or us pulling it away from people because we're avoiding mm-hmm. addressing the thing that, that we're avoiding so it's like it's such a like poignant moment to hear this kid just being like, life's crazy, man. Basically, (laughs) 
<laughs> and then taking and a huge like, bong rip and going, life's yeah, crazy, man. Literally just like <laughs> ripping from the bong. Life's fucking wild, dude. <laughs> Uh, that's what's in the script too. Yeah. Uh, child rips from bong and, and improvises line about how crazy life is. Uh, he did do a lot of improv in this though, for real. Oh, you can, and you crazy. can tell like, yeah, you can tell. Genius I thought like there's child. so many fun little conversations, mm-hmm. the tree about the fungal network between the trees and how they talk to each other. Mm-hmm. He has that was was something that was very interesting to me. Yeah. But like, I just love this moment, this like ending because it is like, again, it's like exposition about their relationship and their past without it being like, yeah. blah, 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 blah. It's just like <laughs> a, as subtle as can be of just mm-hmm. like, like, oh man, wow. Yeah, we've never really talked about any of this stuff, huh? No. Yeah. And it's not made into this like big dramatic reveal. It's just like, hey, I've been thinking about this. Oh yeah, cool. It's Which is like natural. great. Yeah. Yeah. It it's just feels like it comes out naturally. Something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's beautiful. Gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Gorgeous. So, yeah, that is when the dad, so meanwhile, while all this has been happening, the dad was put into maybe some sort of psychiatric facility and is getting better now. He's normal now, as they say, <laughs> and comes out. And Not uh, that having bipolar <laughs> disorder is abnormal. We're no. not saying it's abnormal. No, no, it's, no. It's, 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 but he is, he is uh, leveled. Yeah. He's leveling out. He's leveling out. Yeah. Yeah. Just polar. (laughs) So the mom is going to come and get the kid. But since the kid and Joaquin have grown so close over this time, that is also very devastating. Like at first he misses his mom, but now he also doesn't want to leave his new best friend, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that, well, yeah, it's like almost like uh, what I think is so sweet about that is it almost like ensures that you as the viewer know that the future for this family is better mm-hmm. is is more like healthy and more they're they're all going to communicate more they will be in each other's lives Joaquin will be there mm-hmm. for this kid forever he they've developed something that has changed their family dynamic forever yeah also i can very much identify with the anger of like, but I'm having fun. Like I'm having fun. I want this and not thinking about it in the like practical terms mm-hmm. of just like, right. But you live with your mom. You can't like, you can't be here forever. Kids don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kids don't think like that. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing that I think is literally the perfect encapsulation of a kid of that age in this circumstance is when his mom shows back up, she comes in, she hugs everybody, says, hi, when Joaquin says goodbye to the kid, the kid barely says a word back to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The kid just walks away with his head down because he's sad and he knows that he's going to, like, he doesn't want to even look at him because he'll be upset. Yeah. It's like such a real thing for kids to just be like, to not want to show that they're like sad about it. Mm-hmm. So they just like kind of walk away and get in the car. Yeah. And, and that's like, I just loved that moment because it is like, that isn't unusual. Like mm-hmm. Joaquin's not like, wait, why aren't you saying anything to me? It's just that's the way a kid would act here. Right. He mm-hmm. like he's just like, oh, like I don't, I don't even want to like think about it. <laughs> I used to do that when we were like leaving my grandma's house mm-hmm. when I was a kid. I would just be like, all right, it's time to go. Bye, grandma. I'd hug her and then I'd leave. Yeah. Because I would love to be at her house because she had like a basement and dogs that I liked that <laughs> we could play with. Mm-hmm. And so I would just hate to leave. But then there's like just a very sweet, real moment between the brother and sister. And you just know that they are not going to be so closed off from each other anymore. Yeah. Uh, but it's not this like huge, what have we learned, folks? Right. <laughs> it's just like, uh, it's literally just like, I love you. You know, like like a real heartfelt I love you mm-hmm. that like sends us off. And then the big sort of emotional sort of takeaway of the movie is that letter, basically, that audio letter mm-hmm. that Joaquin records we did skip nephew. one thing, which what did is we skip? the screaming scene. Oh, well, that is the big, <laughs> that's the big, like, mm-hmm. basically him saying when he's upset that he's got to leave, that to me is all wrapped up in him mm-hmm. being upset about having to leave with his uncle and his uncle basically the screaming being like, was great. fucking do it. Mm-hmm. Just fucking be upset, be angry. I think like, that's also around that time is when he has that line of be funny, comma, when you can, period. 
mm-hmm. if that's his way of dealing with things. And yeah. That is actually a line that Mike Mills' kid said to him when he couldn't wow. figure out how to finish this script. He said he asked yeah. his kid, should it be funny or not? I don't know. I don't know how to finish my script. And then his kid said, well, be funny, comma, when you can, period. And he Dang. said that was such a weird, like, and sort of deeply philosophical thing for his kid who was seven at the time yeah. to say. Man, a seven-year-old seven said that? Seven-year-old. Yeah, just popped out with that. Can you believe that? Well, yeah, that kid, that, that kid is wise beyond their years. Yeah, and that's a Mike Mills child. <laughs> no, man. What are they going to grow up to That kid's going to grow up to, yeah, I was going to say, they're going to grow up to <laughs> be like shit. <laughs> some fucking poet or fucking author that's going to write a book that changes the world. But yeah, that, oh yeah. That, I mean, and also that scene in that garden, whatever that place is, yeah. wherever they were, there's some shots in there that are just like jaw dropping. Like the one big wide shot of like the big crazy tree and they're like just tiny in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. There's just like so many just beautiful moments in there and then just yeah. them staring at each other and screaming. Mm-hmm. And I, I really truly love that the kids can't, couldn't scream without smiling. Yeah. Like, like it's he like, did like one time. Yeah. And then the smile came. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, you, it's, that's so real too. Mm-hmm. Like he's like, it is once funny. You crack it's goofy. It, you crack. Yeah. 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 You realize how stupid it all is. Yeah. Ugh. And just that cute little, just like half smile. He's like screaming, like, ah, but you can tell that he's smiling while he's screaming. The corners of his mouth like, are like curling up a little. Uh, yeah. It's so good. It's so, so, so good. <laughs> yeah. That was just really uh, gorgeous and emotional moment. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard to scream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it hurts it hurts to scream sometimes yeah. mm-hmm. we don't get yeah. many opportunities oh, to do it it's such a good movie yeah it's so good i can't wait for i can't wait to be able to own it i know that's what <laughs> i, I said i can't wait to be able to it. own it and be able to fully feel it and spend an entire day crying in my house <laughs> and not have to like think about driving or like anything else or like looking like i'm not sobbing my eyes out in front of a room full of people um, yeah. afterwards. I lucked yeah. out. I saw it when I saw it, it was in a, a, a theater, an AMC here that had recliner chairs mm-hmm. and there was only was two other people in the whole like theater. That. Yeah. There was no other people, like two other people in the Damn. theater. They weren't even close to me. I could just, <laughs> I could let it rip. But even once, <laughs> once the lights come up, then those two people are looking you right in the eyes. Oh, and I you got to go in the I lobby put, with all the teens and you're like, oh I put my, my sunglasses on and I'm just like walking out with my hat pulled down <laughs> over my eyes. You it's so funny it. we're sitting here talking about how beautiful this movie is for like teaching kids and people how to like mm-hmm. express themselves and then I'm like there's no way these people <laughs> can see me cry <laughs> I'll never let these people see me be emotional <laughs> I don't cry <laughs> I've never cried crying's for girls these things these are dry <laughs> bone these dry are like, <laughs> these are like little walnuts <laughs> in here no water <laughs> walnuts no <laughs> I cried. I cried so much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's so good. It's just so, it's so emotional. And in a way that's, it's also interesting that my experience wasn't that it was emotionally draining. It was sort of no, emotionally no, no, no. fulfilling in a way. Yeah. It was like uplifting because I think what it was, it, 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 it it's like a movie that validates your humanity. Yeah. And like your, your like sort of need to express yourself and to express those emotions and being mm-hmm. sad is okay being angry is okay yeah having emotions about things that are tough isn't weak it's it's like that and is learning what... how to figure it out is also okay if you don't know like there's yeah. that scene yeah. where joaquin has to like literally read off of his phone like steps yes. to apologize yeah. or whatever. it's okay to not know how to express it yeah Ugh. but working on it's tight it's so good it's yeah so tight yeah this movie's so tight it's so tight <laughs> It's um, just so good. Yeah. So then, you know, zipping back to what you started with bringing up earlier to that last scene when the kid receives that audio message from Joaquin Phoenix's character where, yeah, he had told him he wouldn't remember any of this, but he would help remind him so that he recorded everything about their time together and sent it to him. And yeah. we just cry and cry. Also, that yeah. line where when that initial scene happens, when about the memory the kid says something like you have the brain capacity of an actual deceased person <laughs> like, yes that was an improv line from that kid i mean so that laugh you get from joaquin is like a real laugh from this kid being stupid and a great. true genius this kid is about to be in every movie He's about to pop the hell off yeah he's gonna be this is the next <laughs> chalamet here this, yes, this kid absolutely. this kid is like he's gonna like grow up to be like 
just the craziest, coolest actor. Hopefully. Uh, he's going to make millions of dollars. Child actors, I mean, we've seen things go down, but hopefully it turns he's, out well for this one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You got to hope that he goes in the direction of like uh, one of the good ones. He was talking about that Mike Mills inspired him that he wants to be a director now. Isn't that so That's cute? Awesome. Yeah. That's so cute. I guess he had to direct some little film for his school. Yeah, Already. he's going to be the youngest director to ever get into Sundance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like 14 Damn, year olds going to direct. What like, is the age? I wonder. I mean, I'm sure you, if you, I mean, if you can do it, I guess you can, if you're 50, 14 or 15, make a movie. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Oh, Damn. that would make me so sad if he gets a movie into Sundance <laughs> and I'm 35 and I'm like, <laughs> no film festival wants to watch my stuff. Huh. <laughs> cool. That's fine. Makes you think. <laughs> huh. Maybe I should do something else. No. <laughs> no, no, no. It's I should never do anything else. No. <laughs> I I have no other skills, no. so I really can't. I can't do anything else. I can only be be funny and uh point cameras at stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> That's all I got. Making a career off being goofy. Like I said, Love goals. <laughs> yeah. All right, so that's pretty much roll creds, right? After that scene, yeah. we're crying, yeah. crying. They roll creds, and there's more interviews yeah. over the credits. Yeah, um, and some of that world noise that he picked up earlier was also in yeah. the credits. So yeah, yeah, just gorgeous, uh, beautiful movie. Everyone go watch it. Yeah, everyone right now. go watch it. You know what else I think is cool that so much of this movie is about being overwhelmed. They're being overwhelmed with their experiences, or being overwhelmed with each other, and. I don't think you ever feel overwhelmed watching oh, no. it. It Not always feels like there's some kind of safety net there. And yeah, and it's like, yeah, it's. I'm telling you, it's because it, there's no none of this like sort of rough. There's no rough edges that are like yeah. scary. It's all like so like n- nicely sort of polished mm-hmm. and like sort of presented in such a like. There's like serenity in it mm-hmm. that I I can't even really place it's just like so soft it feels like a very soft movie yeah i agree which i think like just texturally and like like everything it feels like it's very much like yeah just like you sink into it Mm -hmm. you don't really bounce off of it and it doesn't like hurt you just kind of like (laughs) sink into it yeah in a very cool way yeah Uh, i don't think i've seen any movie that made me feel like how this movie makes me feel agree yeah hard agree yeah Yeah. i mean i truly I, i tweeted this the day i saw it I think this is my favorite movie of my adult life. Mm-hmm. Like since I like feel like I watched movies for like to understand them. Mm-hmm. I think no movie has like made me feel leaving it as good and like as like connected to it. I was just I felt so connected to it in a way that yeah. I've never felt with like another movie that I've seen. Yeah. Uh, maybe in my whole life even. You like, get inside the movie, so, but the so, movie gets inside you too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It's it's coursing through my veins. <laughs> so. That being said, you got to score this out of five, but I think I could guess. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I, I know it's like, it's like cheesy and it's like hack to like say this, but like this like break, it breaks the scale for me. Like this was like Hell yeah. beyond a five. Yeah. Like, like, cause I've seen a lot of movies that I'm like, oh, that's a five star movie. Mm-hmm. But like th- it's because like this is like a different thing to me where it's like a really good movie but also like did things for me personally, like emotionally Mm -hmm. uh, that I don't think any other movie will ever be able to achieve Mm. for me. Mm -hmm. So I like want to give it like, I want to be like, you get seven so that no (laughs) other movie can even really kind of get close. Yeah. Because it is like, like I, I'm the kind of person who, who also thinks that like, like I would say like Hobbs and Shaw was like a four. Yeah. So like, this movie is like, because just of how entertained I was by that movie. It's mm-hmm. so like, th- but this movie is like so far beyond that in terms of like what it meant watching it to me that I can't even say it's a five. It's got to be, it's got to break the scale. Yeah. Five plus. We'll call it a five plus. Five plus. Okay. Yeah. I give it a five plus. I think, honestly, I can probably agree. Not only just your personal experience, like everyone's personal experience, like watching this film and how that feels, but... When you do break it down, like on a technical level, thinking about how you accomplish everything that he accomplishes in this film, how you make the relationship so natural in a way that you've written, like mm-hmm. <laughs> it's way harder than you'd think. <laughs> um, yeah. It, like, he, yeah. Yeah. He does it so flawlessly. Um, and then, yeah, just all the layers of everything we 
talked about just um, technically like the shots, the sound, everything involved with this is just gorgeous and raw and beautiful and emotional. And it's absolutely a five plus, I think. Yeah. It's very, it's a special film. Yeah. Yeah. It should be so boring. (laughs) Like on, you know, like on paper, this movie should be so boring, but it is so good. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, five plus, Mike. Mike, you hear us? We give you a five plus, Mike. Mike, good come job, on the Mike. Pod. Yeah, Mike, come on the pod. Five plus, come on the pod. Uh, hell yeah! And I think safe to say that we would both recommend this film. Yeah. Oh, more times than ever. Hell like, yeah. I can. And I, I, to be fair, I can see it not being some people's cup of tea. Mm-hmm. I can see. I can understand people, what people as would we go said, to, who are not in touch with their emotions. Right. Yeah. I think it would be a hard movie for people to see who are emotionally uh, not as yes mm-hmm. and have. I think if you could if you could identify with this movie, but aren't sort of in touch with your emotions enough to like process that it's not bad that you see yourself here, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> it, then it could hurt you. Uh, <laughs> but I think I think. Yeah, if you like movies, you will like this movie. Mm -hmm. I think if you're a movie person, there is no way you will not like this movie. And I I think this movie probably has to be experienced alone. I don't know. I can't. I've seen it twice now alone. I can't imagine having to, yeah, deal with someone else's experience Mm -mm. at the same time. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Because I think it also is like it's a mirror in in a weird way. Yeah. Or like a magic eye where like you have to do it yourself. Like somebody else. like DIY. (laughs) <laughs> it's a yeah, DIY like, movie hey, experience. Hey, did you hear what he just said? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't talk. Don't talk to me. Don't talk don't to me. Don't look movie. at me. Don't touch me. I'm gonna be crying <laughs> over here by exactly. myself. <laughs> and I'm fine. And, and I I'm am fine. fine. <laughs> I don't need anyone to ask if I'm okay. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm totally okay. I'm fine. Now it's time for screen vomit. So in this part of the pod, we just talk about whatever else we've been watching lately. Movies, shows, okay. whatever else you've been watching. So what have you been watching? Uh, I recently realized mm-hmm. that I am like, uh, I've always been like, oh, I'm going to be, I want to like, I want to like make TV shows. So I have to like watch TV, a lot of TV. Mm-hmm. And I realized recently that I don't think I like TV as much as I like movies. Yeah. So, and I, so I've been, I like watch, I watch the t- shows that everybody says you have to watch. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, like Succession mm-hmm. and all these. I'm an episode behind on Succession, but like but I'm like I'm realizing, succession. I like it. It's okay I if like you don't it. like. I don't think I'm as I'm like addicted to it as a lot of people yeah. are. But like the I things, don't like, like it. The, really, and I get dragged that's, for that. Wow, that's bold to say. Out I gave loud it three episodes worth of trying. Then three, wow. they're like hours, aren't they? Aren't they an yeah, hour? Yeah, they're long. They're so, long. So uh, three you hours. You gave it three hours of your I life. I tried. Mm, yeah. didn't like it. Uh, so I've been watching that, but it's didn't like, it didn't like really like resonate. Mm -hmm. It doesn't resonate with me in the way that I think it does for a lot of other people. Yeah. But I have been like sort of in the pro, I just like to like know what's being made. Yeah. So I like watch, I've been like watching movies that I maybe didn't catch before. Mm -hmm. So like I just watched Shang-Chi, the new like Mm. Marvel Mm -hmm. movie, which I thought was great. Very fun. Okay. Obviously, Ghostbusters. I saw Ghostbusters yeah. recently. I have got opinions, <laughs> uh, but I won't. Sp- okay. I, I, Next I, time. I, I, I <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just watched Pig, which I thought mm, was great mm-hmm, with Nick Cage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think he's like secretly a, like one of the best actors. He can be. He can phone it in, but he can yeah. be great when he wants to like, be. Yeah. When he's like when he's on, he's freaking he's on. fucking on. And he's, he's having so a renaissance too. Like yeah. I think maybe ever since like Mandy maybe that he's just oh, been he refound experience. his audience, you know? Yeah. That movie ma- that was like a fever dream. Incredible. Uh yeah. so I saw that. What else have I watched? I watched that stupid Ryan Reynolds in the Rock movie from Netflix on an airplane. Going back Wait, from Chicago, Red Red Notice, oh, where the, where Ryan Reynolds and Gal Gadot are art thieves, <laughs> and Dwayne Johnson is a like a cop who's like trying to catch them, and Classic. he teams up with Ryan Reynolds. It's so weird. <laughs> I fell I fell asleep through like the first like the middle like Ryan minutes. Reynolds movies are always um, their own kind of experience. <laughs> but here's the thing, though. Uh-huh. I think he's not that bad. Like yeah. I, I, I saw Free Guy, he which just makes I had interesting so choices. 
Yeah, I had <laughs> such low expectations for mm-hmm. that Free Guy movie. And then I watched it, and I actually ca- I thought it was kind of nice. Yeah. Uh, he did a I movie that he like where he's like a serial killer that like heard voices and cut people's heads off and like had relationships with people's heads. Do you don't oh, know what I'm talking about? I don't know about that <laughs> one, but I think I need to go and watch that. I watched that one at random, sounds just incredible. like scrolling through Tubi or something and found it. Man, and uh, uh, I also felt like I was going in for something incredibly dumb, but it was actually pretty entertaining. Oh, so that sounds great. I wish I could remember what it was called, uh, but I can't. <laughs> It's like cat and dog uh, talk to him. Oh, French Dispatch. Mm, Saw okay. French Dispatch. Yeah. It was the first of Wes Anderson's movies in a while that I, I think I enjoyed. Really? Uh, yeah. I I find him a little tedious sometimes, mm-hmm. but I think that this- But you the, didn't that find this that was, movie tedious? No, because I think it was sh- the, sh- the shorts element of it, mm-hmm. that it was little the bite-sized segments. bits. Mm-hmm. I, I found it easier to swallow. <laughs> uh then I saw Dune. I really like Dune. Mm-hmm. I like Dune too. And then I saw oh the new the new James Bond movie. Mm-hmm. I like that too. I like every movie. Mm-hmm. That's really the problem. Yeah, I like every movie that I see in theaters. I don't think that's a problem. I think that actually rocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just like like the experience. I think enough that like no matter what I'm watching, I'm just like other people probably think this sucks, but I You're like practicing it. radical positivity. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's actually cool to like things, and people are afraid to admit that it's yeah, cool right? to like things. A no, lot. it's fun. But it's fun to be excited about fun. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I, uh, yeah. Otherwise, I really just watch uh, wrestling. I watch professional wrestling. Oh, nice. Still. What kind? <laughs> all of it. All I don't it? watch it all actively. Mm-hmm. But if but it's I, on. I I I keep up with it on Twitter, and I'll watch mm-hmm. it here and there because my brother and I got back into wrestling like seven years ago we were big on it when we were younger yeah and then my brother who's older got back into it and he got me back into it and now it's like one of those things that we you bond on yeah we can talk about it if we both are paying attention so it's a nice thing to like have as like a go-to like oh did you watch this let's talk about it Mm -hmm. but yeah i'm like i'm not i i think i i i'm kind of out on tv right now i think Mm -hmm. i'm like there's too much of it and too many things that people are saying you gotta watch Mm -hmm. where i'm just like all right, that's too much. I'm just going to watch the movies I want to watch. And, I have a hard time watching that. anything that somebody tells me I got to watch, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'll love it. Sorry, everyone, yeah. if that's how you feel about Come On, Come On now, but <laughs> if you do feel that way. I don't know. People do take what I say sometimes, I've been told. But um, yeah, I, I'm not really a TV guy anymore either. I think since Pandy, yeah. really, I stopped watching TV and started watching movies only. I really don't yeah. watch TV shows at all anymore. Not really. Yeah. I want to do, start doing a little bit more uh, like sort of deeper dives on, uh, into mm-hmm. older stuff because I also am weirdly a person who I say this as a joke to get a rise out of people, but I do kind of believe it that the first good movie ever made was Jurassic Park. Okay. And I, again, I say that <laughs> specifically because it makes people so upset mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's hilarious. Yeah. But I am like, I do think that I've had a hard time in my life connecting with like really old movies mm-hmm. because I think I like camera movement is a thing that I really appreciate. Mm. So like a lot of older movies had a lot more stam- like st- uh, static camera. And so it's hard for me to like You're really like, like sort of black be... and white eras. Type yeah. Stuff? Like, mm-hmm. l- like real olds, real olds. Mm-hmm. Uh, even like weirdly, like I haven't really done a deep dive into like Kubrick or any like any mm-hmm. like of the like big guys of the seventies yeah. ish time. And I think I want to like break myself out of that weird obsession or like weird thought that I'm not gonna like an old movie. I think you just uh, have and to just go for it. It the thing about older movies is you have to find the things you like, and it seems easier to do that with things that are current or more current right. because you can yeah. find them easier and things that are older that you've heard of just might not be your type but right. so you have to dig and the digging yeah. is hard yeah because yeah. it's like i for the longest time i'd never seen the godfather mm-hmm. I still and have. that was like one really that was one where i was like everybody's like, oh you gotta see it. it's great mm-hmm. and i was like oh, it just like feels like it's dated yeah but then i like watched it and i was like oh okay no i get it yeah like it i get why people talk mm-hmm. about this movie as like that that important yeah Uh, but i think there's a lot of movie like old movies that i've kind of like missed that i think Mm -hmm. uh i i need to go back and like kind of do my due diligence as as a person who wants to do this for the rest of my life yeah i think i need to 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 dig a little deeper and to find some some older stuff that is yeah you just gotta find it i think 
So my personal relationship with becoming like a cinephile, I guess, or becoming like someone who knows a lot about older stuff or whatever, has seen all the big people and stuff, was I watched this movie called Relaxer, like... Uh, over a year ago I don't know but it's just like an indie film but and it's a newer one but it was unlike anything I had ever seen and I thought it was just the coolest thing I'd ever seen and I kind of went into what that director's inspirations were or what he drew from yeah, for that film and yeah. sort and started seeking out that stuff and mm-hmm. that really cracked older films for me I watched yeah. like this film called Exterminating Angel which is I think from the 60s but it's a Spanish film Um, about a bunch of people who get trapped in a room inexplicably. It was really cool. Um, I started watching Alan Clark films that are really cool or like old Haneke stuff and not just like funny games, but like all of it. Right. Or there's a movie called Angst from Mm. the early, it might be from the early 80s, but it has like a really old feel and it's a German film that's just really fucking cool. And I started just spiraling, finding all the cool deep cut shit. Right, right, Um, yeah. You know? So once you find your in... I think, I think you that's find it, the yeah. things that you like. I think, I, yeah, I, I, I'm such a, like, I'm steeped in, like, in speed, yeah. Independence Day, <laughs> and, like, bad boys. Yeah. That I just, like, it's, like, going back to, like, before the 90s and being, like, okay, but what was cool stuff that people were doing before then? Yeah. And not, not pigeonholing myself into this person who's, just, I like big spectacles. Yeah. But then I also like these, like, sort of smaller, like, like intimate mm-hmm. like little movies so it's or like, like old jarmish jim jarmish right, movies right mm-hmm. yeah i've like never really done a deep dive into his stuff but yeah. like a- anything of his that i've seen i'm like oh i do like that yeah so i think yeah i just need to like stop telling myself the lie that i don't like old movies and just start watching <laughs> you just gotta do the work and find what you do like <laughs> exactly and the yeah. work is hard yeah, yeah. the work yeah and it's yeah to find good stuff i mean it's impossible <laughs> Uh, it's really impossible. When you find it, most it stuff's bad. Mm-hmm. Most stuff is terrible. That's it's the reality. It's just harder the the older that you get. But yeah, once you find mm. your in, you'll find the stuff that you like. You just got to find your wait. in. Yeah. <laughs> if you need Rex, hit me up. Yeah. Send me a, a list of three hundred movies that I. I will. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me for any specific Rex, and I'll give them to you. Oh, I watched that's great almost seven hundred movies this year. Holy shit. Is that fucked up? <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> this year. <laughs> Multiples in a day. That's yeah. like. That's on the weekends? O- that's over. That's like two a day sometimes. On the weekends, I'll crack three or four movies on a day. Wow. Maybe more, wow. depending, you Damn. know, on how depressed I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's always the caveat. It's like, oh, I could probably do that. Depends on how pre- depressed I am yeah. in a day. So, you know. We'll but. see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway. Anytime. Hit me up for Rex. I'm really serious. Thank you. Um, Tell me what you like and what you want. I'll give you a list. Awesome. (laughs) If you care. I don't know. Um, No, that's like you're like my personal video store. (laughs) I'm really serious. I really, (laughs) I just really love movies and I want to share that with people. I have a whole podcast about it, in fact. So. (laughs) (laughs) That we're on right now. Yeah. (laughs) Hello, everyone. And especially (laughs) as much as I can share like deeper cut artists who are real artists i mean yeah that's what i value and respect so as much yeah. as i can get the, that out the there. weirdest the weirdest oh i just remembered the mm. weirdest oldest movie that i've watched recently yeah. i watched this like old de palma movie the the phantom of the paradise mm-hmm. have I you don't seen think this I've seen that. it's like it is off the wall yeah like it's basically phantom of the opera but set at like a like 70s early late 70s early 80s like performance art club Mm -hmm. where they they do these like big it's like these big shows with these like musical acts and like it sounds familiar it's it's there's an image in it that is like that very heavily influenced daft punk's aesthetic Mm -hmm. uh they're like helmets and they're like sort of like cage that they perform in yeah but it is off the wall like it's it's just absurd and like the acting is so bad and huge like everybody's going so big okay uh and the costumes are wild and like the sets are insane it's just like such a spectacle Add it to me. uh i would say it's not a good movie <laughs> but like you'll watch it and you'll like multiple times watching it i was like holy shit what yeah <laughs> like what are they doing? Okay. Sometimes great, just the creativity is 
interesting. Like, I don't know, oh, yeah. good is so subjective, and there are things you can really respect about a film without thinking it's like quote unquote good <laughs> yeah i mean that's like my experience with like every fast and furious movie yeah where i'm just like i can tell you objectively it's not a good movie no, but i but love fun watching as fuck. it yeah 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 like i loved the new like there are fast different Nine. things you can expect from yeah. films too if you just want like there's a hoot and holler film that's what i would consider yeah. that to be or if you yeah. want something oh, yeah. more emotional or if you want you know there's like different expectations you can have for a film too and the, all of those things can yeah. exist and be good and fun yeah. absolutely I agree. There's not one type of good movie, folks. Nah, nah, folks. <laughs> there's tons of different. There's tons of different kinds of good good movies, folks. <laughs> I, I wish I had a cool voice, is. but I don't. Yeah, I don't know who this character is. <laughs> well, I like it, folks. <laughs> folks, there's tons of good kinds of different kinds of movies. I guess it's like sort of Bernie Sanders, <laughs> folks. Uh, it's light. Bernie. Different kind of movies. Yeah, I just don't the way I those words. The word mm-hmm. certain words came out kind of Bernie-ish. <laughs> kind of burnt i don't know i'll workshop uh-huh. it <laughs> yeah. all right so i'm gonna do my shit that i've been watching if that's oh, yeah. cool all right so i kind of um have this thing where sometimes i keep a list of shorts and features that i think would go good together um mm. so i done i done a pair recently <laughs> um, so one of them uh they actually both relate to this film actually the short film deformer that's a mike mills short uh documentary and then the feature documentary beautiful losers which mike mills is in and harmony corin oh. and a whole bunch of other people i feel like i've heard someone else talking about that recently what is that um beautiful losers is from like 2008 and it's a documentary about this sort of punk collective in new york city of right. artists and skaters and filmmakers yeah. and just really creative people who found each other at this time in like the late 90s. Um, yes. And Mike Someone Mills was, was part of that. And... that. Literally this past weekend. Someone yeah. was talking about it. I actually got it on DVD recently. I won a I won a contest through Oscilloscope. Do you know what Oscilloscope is? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I won five hundred dollars <laughs> to their website. So <laughs> I got fucking a whole bunch of uh, movies recently, and that was that's one awesome. of them. <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> it was a costume contest. Oh, that's great. What was your costume? Have you seen the film Buzzard? You may no. not have. Uh, it's an indie film from like 2014, done by the same person who did Relaxer, which I just spoke of. Um, okay. You should. I love all of their films. They're so sick. But okay. um, there's a. What's it called? What is it called? Buzzard. Is that Buzzard. one? Buzzard and Relaxer are their two big ones. Okay. So in Buzzard, there's like a really long scene of the main character just um, like eating spaghetti in a bathrobe. <laughs> but like it's really it's like four and a half minutes of him just eating spaghetti. And I actually recreated the whole scene. Um, <laughs> And uh, my costume was perfectly on point. There was makeup. There was hair. There was every detail. Um, there was a big wow. pile of spaghetti. Um, <laughs> he like gets it all over himself. It was a whole thing. So uh, yeah, that won me five hundred bucks for a oscilloscope. That's great. So that's amazing. <laughs> it's funny too. Like uh, speaking of a shot of mm-hmm. eating anything for four minutes, there's David Lowry. A ghost story. There's a scene where Rooney Mara eats a mm. pie for seven minutes straight, a single yeah. shot. Uh, and my friend did the score. So it, no, wow. the, the long, long scene score. <laughs> Just bringing it back to me, of course, because that's Hell what yeah. this is all about. Uh, that's awesome. No, that sounds great. Yeah. Uh, 500 bucks for just dressing up fun. That's great. Yeah. And just to spend at like a cool DVD store, basically. Um, yeah. All their DVDs, almost all of them are like limited special edition stuff too. So that's really sick. And then they also, oh, wow. they have like, I got a velvet poster. That's a love, the love witch. I don't know if you've seen the love witch, but no. um, that's a really cool movie. And they have like a special like hand done velvet poster that I got Whoa. was part of my five hundred five hundred bucks is a lot of money to spend yeah, I was on DVDs. Say, for like DVDs. Because yeah, I got like, like what, all like... the stuff I wanted, all the stuff I'd heard of, and then I still had like two hundred and fifty bucks left to spend. Yeah, because like <laughs> what does a DVD even cost now? Like nine dollars? Like well, they have to be like most of theirs because they're, they're, they're special. Limited, yeah, they're right? like twenty something dollars. Okay. But even then yeah. it's still like a lot yeah. of fucking movies. So I just started like after I got all the stuff I wanted, all the stuff I heard of, I just was like googling the premises like does this look cool i don't know like (laughs) adding (laughs) shit so um beautiful losers was one that i like yeah hadn't heard of and looked at the poster i was like what's this about and saw that it was harmony corn and mike mills and all these cool people basically yeah just documenting their punk collective which that's cool is 
really cool. And I also like fell into a punk collective when I was uh, of a younger age and it was crucial to my life. So yeah, it's sick to see that on screen too. Yeah. That sounds great. Um, yeah. So, (laughs) so that's one thing. Um, I got like five things on my list. All right. I rewatched another short that I think would pair cool with come on, come on too. So this is another short feature pairing. Um, this short called crown prince by Sammy Birch and Alex mechanic. Um, starring Max Jenkins. I love all three of those people. All the stuff they do is really cool. It's like a five-minute short. It's mostly improv by Max, and Mm. it's just cute, fun little short. (laughs) And Okay, so I watched this movie, The Golden Glove. I may have to do an episode on this sometime because (laughs) I think it's one of the most disturbing movies I've ever seen in a really cool way. (laughs) I feel like saying disturbing like brings a certain image to mind and I feel like that doesn't line up with what I mean by when I say disturbing but I don't know how else to put it into words. It's um it's a German movie. It's uh based off of a real serial killer. So it's like this guy who's a serial killer, but it's so incredibly violent without really being that gory, Mm. but with being extremely fucked up. It was just very, (laughs) I'm trying to think of like a better way that I could describe it, but I don't even, there's not even words. I've never seen anything like it. Um, The Golden Glove was really fucking good. I'm not usually into like serial killer stuff anyway. I'm like true crime and all that stuff is not really my jam typically, but the movie's really well done and if you do watch it i also think the makeup in it is sick as hell like the makeup and the special <laughs> effects are so fucking cool the way that the main actor looks in the movie versus how he looks in real life it's insane um oh, they wow. really went all out for this film and it's cool as hell it is disturbing though trigger warning <laughs> exclamation, <laughs> point, exclamation on that one um, <laughs> all right um i watched running on empty with River Phoenix, so also tangentially related uh, to this film, I guess. Um, with River Phoenix and Martha Plimpton. Um, I'd say that was just fine. It was a fine film. There's not much really <laughs> to say about it, except River Phoenix and Martha Plimpton randomly have like the best kiss chemistry I think I've ever seen <laughs> in a movie. <laughs> and I, that just felt kiss really chemistry, random. Folks. You know? I don't know. It's important. I think um, watching people kiss in films. It's always an experience. <laughs> yeah. And Sometimes often a strange awful. one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes you're just like, ugh. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes I'm like, have I been doing kissing wrong? This looks strange <laughs> to me. I don't, is that what it's supposed to be? I don't understand. Um, <laughs> so, so, We've um, all been doing kissing wrong uh, yeah. all these years. I mean, who knew? I Nobody told me the rules. I don't know. So, um, but that movie was, it was fine too, uh, pretty good. It's like River Phoenix's family is like on the run because his parents committed crimes. So they have to like keep bouncing cities constantly and getting new identities, but he falls in love. And so it creates a uh, so conflict with leave. their lifestyle. Yeah. I can't leave. I love her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the face that went with that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Two more. I watched a short, a Swedish short called Short Calf Muscle. That was just really fun, kind of absurd short about a man that everyone keeps telling him he's a gnome and uh, he doesn't believe he's a gnome. I don't know. And it just kind of goes from there. But it was just a fun, like cute little short Short calf muscle. Um, And then lastly, I watched Swingers, classic 1996 film, Vince Vaughn and others. Um, Vince Vaughn being absolutely hunk as hell. Like I've never seen him be so hot. I never even thought of Vince Vaughn as a person who could be hot. And yeah. uh, back in the day, absolute he, stud. Yeah, what yeah. The hell? I, I haven't seen that. I saw that movie a long, long time. Yeah, ago. I haven't watched it in ages. But yeah, like I mean, he's like yeah, like just like chiseled face. Oh my cool god, hair, cool hair. Yeah, Dude. deep eyes. Yeah, great style. A little these bit of guys. guns. Yeah. Oh yeah, little bit of something in the arms. And yeah. he's like, um, he's so smooth in the film too. Like, kind of his whole character is that he's like a smooth talking like lady picker upper i don't know what you call those people but lady picker upper yeah that's it. i think that's it <laughs> um so <laughs> yeah it was sick i um i've been trying to also get through so like my experience of watching movies growing up was uh my dad was really into like indie art film art house you know cult horror type shit so like that's yeah. kind of all i watched growing up so i missed all the normal movies that like normal <laughs> people watch <laughs> you're going back in and seeing all the ones that you didn't even realize existed yeah yeah like, um oh, because i was over here watching like 
Wishmaster and like <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know uh John Waters films and shit and have no <laughs> idea about like swingers or like normal stuff anybody else was watching. So I'm trying also to watch the normal movies I missed. It's so funny the idea of flipping <laughs> flipping the expectation there where like everybody is just like, "Oh, I grew up on like all these normal movies yeah. and now I'm going back in and like <laughs> watching all these weird B movies. Yeah. And, uh, you're, you're that's, like, all, that's all I know no, is I the weird stuff. I didn't even know swingers existed. <laughs> Pretty much. That's so know? funny. So that's kind of my experience. And uh, yeah, that's so great. I am trying to watch some normal movies that, uh, you know, I missed. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So, Great place to start with Vince Vaughn as a well, as a babe. It's certainly not the start, but it is a continuation <laughs> of my journey. <laughs> continuation. So, well, you gotta you have to check in every now yeah, and then. Yeah, gotta with, check with, in. You gotta get a hunk a hunk or two here and there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all we can ask for is a hunk or two. Yeah. All right, so that's all my after darks for this week for now. <laughs> <laughs> So what you got to plug? Where can people find you, et cetera? Okay, so plugs for me. First of all, you can go to uh, at it's John Mackey on Instagram or Twitter if you'd like to follow my stupid stuff there. <laughs> you can go to my website, johnmackey.com, where you can watch my short films with John Milstein, mm-hmm. uh, as well as my short that I wrote and directed like 10 years ago that I still think is pretty good. And you can also see the feature film that I made with my friend Jacob Womack called Lane Woods Finds Love. You can watch them all on my website, johnmaggie.com. You can also see all the stupid commercials and branded content and funnier die sketches that I've done in the course of 10 years. You can also go to biggrandewebsite.com. Biggrandewebsite.com. You can buy all the podcast projects we've done, Teacher's Lounge episodes, a brand new full season of Teacher's Lounge is out. There's other shows we've done. And on December 15th, we released a new set of... uh, minis we'll call them which okay. was a thing that we did with big runner mm-hmm. little improvised scenes it's called uh holidays at the mall <laughs> it is 10 uh 15 to 20 minute improvised scenes all set at the same mall around the holidays so you can go to the website and that is available right now also coming soon in the new year we will be releasing a, a set of live specials that we we shot here in los angeles a couple months ago called when we shot them they were called big grande live on set the name may have changed now we don't know (laughs) but that's what i'm gonna call them now but we did a series of improv shows on full sets with full costumes wardrobe makeup Mm -hmm. that we did not see until we stepped on stage so it was completely improvised from just the inspiration of whatever insane set or wardrobe we were put into and those will be coming out at some point early in 2022 Hell yeah. uh, and you can get all that stuff at dot com, And you can also follow us on uh, Twitter as well, at Big Grande Tweets. And that's where we put all of the stuff that we do. Hell so yeah. that's all. Lots of, this is the most plugs I've ever done on a podcast. <laughs> I have so much stuff to plug. Hell yeah. We're glad to, to be able to continue to make mm-hmm. Still stupid kicking. stuff that mm-hmm. people seem to really like. Yeah. So. <laughs> Can uh, contest. Yeah. If you um, thought I was funny, <laughs> go check out all the stuff that my group makes on our website, Big Grande website, yeah. dot com. Teacher's Lounge, Big I always blog. say, is a podcast I can't listen to in public because um, I just laugh simply too hard. I think I think that's a common sentiment. Yeah. Uh, we, get, we get a lot of tweets that are people being like, I had to turn this episode off on the subway because I was <laughs> laughing too hard. Yeah. Or like, I was driving and I almost rear-ended the car in front of me because I was laughing at this quote from the show. Yeah. No, uh, so listen at literally your own destroys risk. me. <laughs> yeah. oh, well, I appreciate that very much. I listened to it at work once, and I had to hide behind my desk so that no one would see me <laughs> simply crying, laughing. Oh, well, that's that makes me feel very, very, very good. But we want you to true. cry at mm-hmm. our comedy, folks. I do be crying. So if you need a good yeah. cry, <laughs> yes, it's the first. That's depressing, how you should start it's a, advertising. It's a sad it. podcast called Teachers Lounge. <laughs> It'll make you cry. If you need a good cry from laughing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great quote. There you go. We'll quote you on that. <laughs> All right, you can. You can have that one for awesome. free. All right. Well, yeah. yeah, thank you for coming on my show and talking to me simply thank you forever. For having me. <laughs> yeah. No, this is great. Hell yeah. Easy. So easy. These podcast things, they're so easy. Yeah, they really are. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks for being here. And uh, that's it for the show. So we'll see everybody else next week. Bye bye. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was great.
I'm going to sneeze. Or maybe I'm not. I didn't sneeze. Okay, you pranked me. Uh, it could happen. It could happen, though. <laughs> but there are you moments... You come on my that... show and prank me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, 